Blog Talk Radio. Blog Talk Radio. about racism, of course, and before he got started, he said that the term ofe, I guess that's an older term, people might not know, people don't really say it now, but uh, 50 years ago, people said it a lot, I think even before that, it's not really said now. At any rate, it's, it's uh, a derogatory term for white people, 
Um, black people used to say it. I suspect other non-white people probably said it too. Um, but I just thought, you know, it meant a white person. But again, definitions, definitions. Um, he explained at the beginning of the book, he explained why black people uh, called white people au It was pig Latin for foe, an enemy, a foe. Uh, and I just thought, wow, I never heard that explained before. How about that? That's what an ofe is. Hmm. Uh, and I just thought that, uh, and I guess that was discussed on the uh, May 23rd broadcast, excuse me, the May 22nd uh, broadcast uh, of the cows with uh, Mr. Anthony Pryor uh, and talking about whether or not non-white people had a better understanding of racism, white supremacy some years ago. And the fact that at least it had, it had become uh, a part of the code, black people referencing white people as au-phase, foes. Hmm, maybe they did have a better understanding of racism, white supremacy way back when. Uh, they had codified uh, a way to reference white people as foes. Hey, <laughs> um, I, I just found that very interesting and, and wanted to pass that along. Um, number two, actually... Number two, I'm going to share, because I said yesterday on the broadcast that Mr. Uh, Pryor, since I just mentioned his name, he had, uh, he calls them AP-isms, AP-isms. They're in the back of the book that he did, uh, The Slave Side of Sunday. Uh, and I will make sure I include the link to the website where you can get that book for a more reasonable price. I know several folks emailed me before the program, during the program, that they uh, wanted a way to get the book. So uh, I will link the website that he mentioned on the broadcast yesterday. Uh, I'll link it uh, in the show. He said it's going to be a week or so before it's up. So as soon as the website is operational, I'll make sure to link it in the program that we did yesterday. And you can go to the site and uh, pick up a copy of uh, The Slave Side of Sunday and soon to be released, Black Horses, White Cotton, and Religion. Um, but one of the AP-isms that I found uh, Real interesting. And I said, these are just little sayings uh, similar to what Mr. Fuller has uh, at the end of the code book. Uh, he says, the reason professional athletes can't see racism is because they are standing too close to it. Hmm. Very interesting, I thought. Very interesting. Mr. Anthony Pryor author of The Slave Side of Sunday. He's supposed to be back with us for a part two. I cannot wait to get it back on the program again. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Next up, uh, before we get to the boondocks, um, the, pro the earlier broadcast today, uh, Kevin Annette, he was scheduled to be on the program. Uh, he contacted me. He had some troubles on his side. Uh, we actually have rescheduled. So we're going to try again uh, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, uh, that would be Wednesday, May 26th at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Pacific. Kevin and that, he will be back uh, and we'll be talking about, I thought it was going to go real nicely because the gentleman called uh, the broadcast uh, with Anthony Pryor and he said, uh, do you think religion is the strongest weapon of the racist white supremacists? And uh, Kevin and that, he, he talks a lot about how uh, the so-called Christian church played a huge role in the oppression and genocide against non-white people, so-called Native Americans, the indigenous population in the area of the world known as Canada. So that will be uh, this Wednesday. It should be linked already. It should be on the show page. Uh, it should be linked to the documentary film called Unrepentant. Uh, that was one of the first times that in doing research to prepare for a broadcast, it was a little bit difficult. Like that, broad, uh, that, that documentary film, just uh, the way that those victims of white supremacy were abused, uh, it, it was kind of tough. For all, the, all the gruesome stuff that I've had to look at and read or watch to prepare for programs, that was one of the few that, uh, man, I was, I, was, uh, I was not feeling well. But it is linked. And it is, I mean, this is racism, white supremacy. So uh, you can check out the documentary film. You can also check his website if you want to prepare. All that's uh, linked in the description for the broadcast. But that will be uh, this Wednesday. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, let folks know. Um, I had seen a couple folks, I guess they, they made comments and they said that they, I guess, do think the broadcast is uh, constructive or has some value. Uh, and they had mentioned that they 
uh, listen to the cows uh, going to sleep. And I heard other folks, they've called in and said the same thing. Uh, and I just, I thought that was kind of funny because um, way back when, um, before uh, Gus and Back of the Bus started the cows, um, I used to fall asleep listening to counter-racism.com. I would fall asleep listening to, uh, generally, I guess it would be Mr. Fuller's lectures or uh, Dr. Welsing's lectures. That's what I would fall asleep listening to. And uh, it's, uh, it's real strange to know that uh, now there are folks falling asleep listening to Gusty Renegade Justice and the Cows. But the thing that I thought when I heard that was that, man, when I used to listen to uh, counter-racism radio to fall asleep, um, I would end up having dreams about uh, racist white supremacists trying to harm me. Uh, and I still have uh, those dreams from time to time. I just They would be very vivid, very intense, and, uh, man, it was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was kind of disturbing. Like I, I feel like uh, my sleep has been adversely impacted since uh, I have made an effort to focus on racism, white supremacy, and I, I think uh, – back of the bus has mentioned that to me more than once that he too you know has had those uh disruptive dreams uh, about racist white supremacists trying to do something to him uh, even in his sleep um the funny thing it even made re- made me remember a different non-white person uh he was uh staying over one night and uh I fell asleep. That's, I mean, stick to the code, right? We're doing this every night, uh, falling asleep, listening to counter racism radio. And he woke up the next day and he said, Man, listen to that stuff all night. I was dreaming about white people trying to do something to me. And I was like, Yeah, me too. Um, so, yeah, I just I thought that was funny. I thought I would share that's a quasi moment in racism. Uh, I just thought that was interesting. Um, also, wanted to let folks know. Um, and I got this because uh, one of the guests that uh, was supposed to come up for this weekend uh, decided not to do the broadcast. Um, she looked at some – well, I can't say she looked at some. She only mentioned one, uh, and that was the program with uh, Henry Macko. And she said she supports uh, so-called LGBTQ – they had an I at the White Privilege Conference. She didn't have the I, but LGBTQ – uh, people who engage in so-called homosexual activity and blah, 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 um, which is fine, no problem. But I did want to let folks know, um, if you are going to make an effort to replace white supremacy with justice, um, you are going to upset people. Do not think you can do this work um, and be friends with everybody. I, and it's not about generating conflict. It's just racism and white supremacy is war. The conflict is already going on, making an effort to counter the war that has already been waged and has been going on for years now. Um, you are going to invite more conflict uh, to your doorstep, uh, to your life. You are inviting more conflict by addressing it head on, uh, which is the thing to do. That's the thing to do with this because you can't run. I mean, you have a fight or flight response, right? Conflict, danger comes up. Am I going to flee? Am I going to attack? Uh, racism, white supremacy, there is nowhere to run. Uh, if hiding was an option, we wouldn't have the cows. Gus would just be hanging out in wherever the area is that there is no white supremacy, that you can hide from them and not have to deal with it. But there is no such spot uh, on a planet that is dominated by and saturated with racism, white supremacy. So fleeing is not an option. you got to confront it. You got to confront it. You got to confront it. Uh, and in my view, that's a big part of the reason why we have not replaced white supremacy with justice way before now. We do not have enough victims who are willing to confront white people, period. Um, and so, yeah, in doing that, like I said, you're going to upset. Uh, I think that great line, uh, the Spike Lee film. Uh, a Huey P. Newton story. It's not a documentary. Uh, it has an actor. I know his name. I just don't want to say it because uh, it's. Uh, I- I'll mispronounce it, so I don't want to sound ignorant right now. But um, <clears throat> he uh, he has a line where he's portraying Huey P. Newton, 
And he says, uh, if you make an effort to start addressing racism, you are going to upset white people and a whole lot of black people. And that's totally true. You make a stand about racism, white supremacy, just expect people to get mad. If you are a, st a student of history, um, Martin Luther King Jr., he upset a lot of white people and a lot of non-white people while he was alive. That's the, see, that's another thing. If you really study uh, racism, white supremacy, you'll see a lot of these people, these victims who uh, are dead now, many of them killed by white people, racist, white supremacists. Uh, they got stamps now and movies and books and holidays and all this stuff. Uh, when these people were alive and could have been helped, they were hated, vilified. Uh, as I, I think I said before on the broadcast, uh, when Malcolm X was executed, they mocked his death in the New York Times on the day he died. You can check this if you go to uh, – probably have to go to a university library. But uh, if you get the New York Times for February 21st, 1965, you can see they mocked his death. Uh, and this is, this is standard. Uh, with non-white people who have made an effort to combat racism, white supremacy, just being vilified and horribly mistreated while they were alive, and then once they pass, then it's, oh, you know, yay, we like this person, whatever. So I say all that. I uh, expect people to get upset, white people and non-white people. Uh, don't worry about it. I would say, if anything, make an effort not to create conflict between yourself and another non-white person. Do everything you can to minimize that. That's one thing. We make a lot of errors in terms of generating conflict with the non-white people. You don't want to do that. The non-white people that get upset with you, angry with you, calling you names, hate what you're doing, saying you're upsetting these white people, stupid, call you everything but a child of God, really make every effort to not respond, uh, bite your lip as best you can. <laughs> um, and and I, mean, I mean, hey, if you are going to make an effort to counter racism, white supremacy, you're going to have to take some shots. When I say that, you're going to be called some names. People are going to talk bad about you. Uh, you're going to be made to look foolish. You're going to be made to look stupid. Uh, you most likely will be humiliated at some point, probably repeatedly. I don't know any non-white person uh, who has made any sort of effort to replace white supremacy with justice, who has not had all of those things happen to them. I don't know a one. Uh, this system is tough. It's been here a long time, and white people have a whole gang behind them to support their system of injustice. So uh, be humble and consistently remind people, hey, Mr. Fuller has a line I might even have to take uh, I might even have to take a hot second to, to read it because I, I just think it's uh, phenomenal. Um, the line that he has where he's talking about this, where people, if they get upset with him and don't like what he's doing or how he's uh, attempting to counter racism, white supremacy. Uh, in fact, I am going to take a hot second and see if I can locate it. Um, let me see here. Give me a... Uh, Give me two seconds. See if I can see if I can track it down here. I think I have it. I think I have it. And this was from the code. I'll make sure I cite where I got this from. This was uh, posted on the code. Dot net. Again, the code. Dot net. It's linked on the show page. Er, I got it. Okay, it's linked on the show page. Um, and uh, yeah, you can go there and check it out. It's a form. They have some audio clips of Mr. Fuller. Um, you can go there and post. They have a lot of information about the code book and all the areas of people activity. So you can go there. A lot of resources. Josh Wicket posts a lot there. Mr. Edward Williams from the Counter Racism Network. Uh, Mr. Ed Small, who was on the program with uh, Sophia Stewart. All of those folks uh, post there or have posted there a lot. Good information. Okay, the quote. Um, the quote that Mr. Fuller has, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read the whole thing. Uh, he says. Uh, Anywhere on this planet where there are people, the priority should be we have got to do something about the race problem, and we want the smartest people on the case. We shouldn't leave it to amateurs like Neely Fuller or Gus T. Renegade, because that's what you're doing. If anybody doesn't like what I'm saying, Hey, what are you doing? What have you done lately? You are smarter than I am. 
you've been to more schools than I have, if you're white, most likely. But you left it to an amateur. And when you leave big, important issues to amateurs, you're going to get an amateurish result. Because I'm not what you call a heavy thinker. I don't know how the system of racism, white supremacy is put together. So when I start trying to take it apart, it's the bricks in the wrong places. And if you know anything about the way a building comes down, a building is supposed to come down scientifically. The way it goes up, you let an amateur come into an area and say he's on the deconstruction committee and he's going to bring the building down all over you. You'll have bricks all over the street falling on people's cars and all like that. But this is the type of contractors that you've got to do it. The average white person will say, well, I don't have anything to do with racism. I'm just going about my own business in my own way. That's exactly what people said. And I mean, it started World War II. President Roosevelt had to scream to the top of his voice to say, wait a minute, all of this stuff is going to wind up on your doorstep. But you don't have to wait for World War II. Like I said, that explosion behind your ear from a 9 millimeter when somebody's carjacking you. Susan Smith, she's the white woman that blamed the black person for uh, stealing her kids when she actually did it. Susan Smith understood that. That's why she could say that it was a black fella that did it. Because when you say a street criminal, that means black. But how were they produced? They weren't born like this. I know that. There's this little toddler looking innocently up at older people for guidance. The black people don't know too much because they are not taught too much themselves. And white people look at the situation and walk away and think that this situation is not going to catch up with them. You produce a Frankenstein's monster, that monster is going to catch up with you. And that's what the system of white supremacy does. It makes monsters out of people. They stand back and laugh at the monsters at a distance, not knowing that the monster is going to catch up with them when they're sleeping. Crawl through your bedroom at night when you don't have your gun handy. Now you can produce justice or you can start backing up the train and build the death camps. Those are your choices, not any other. That is quoted uh, from Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., author of The Code Book. Um, and, and that is exactly what I say with all of this. Anybody, if you do not like my stance, my analysis of racism, white supremacy, number one, what are you doing? I'm very upfront. And the people that have come to my site and griped and complained about a guest that I had on the program or griped and complained about my analysis of racism, white supremacy, or they didn't like how I wrote a description or don't like the pictures, no one has come to this site and said, wait a minute, there's a black male in the area of the world known as the United States who has done 140 programs about racism, white supremacy with no phone and no computer. No one has come to the site and said that is a disgrace and or my gosh, if he's willing to invest that much with no resources, what am I doing? No one has said that. So, again, all of that to say, if you are a non-white person, expect people to be upset with you. Expect white and non-white people to be upset with you. Be humble. As I said yesterday, promise no easy victories. This is very tough. The confusion amongst non-white people cannot be underestimated. <laughs> Confusion is lethal, and most non-white people are extraordinarily confused about racism, white supremacy, and that will be a major obstacle in your way, major. That cannot be overstated. 
and you have an extraordinary force that is opposing you, the system of white supremacy. Be humble, expect it to be tough, expect it to be extraordinarily tough. Do as best you can to minimize conflict between yourself and other non-white people. Make every effort to be accurate with your words, and don't back down. Don't back down. Don't be afraid to say that you're incorrect because you're probably going to make some errors. Don't be afraid to say, hey, I made a mistake. Don't be afraid to say, hey, I changed my mind. But certainly remind everyone, everything about what I am doing is a response to racism, white supremacy. The only reason the cows exist at all is because of white people who believe in and practice racism, white supremacy. They are the people we should all be most angry with. Right on. Now it is time to get to the boondocks. Um, I guess I, I'm, I'm thinking if I want to start with tonight's episode or if I want to start in general, because it really doesn't matter <laughs> because tonight's episode went right to a lot of the general comments that I had about the boondocks. I'll take, uh, I'll take a hot second to think whether I want to start with the story of Jimmy Rebel or if I want to start in general. I'm going to start in general. I'm going to start in general and then go right into the story of Jimmy Rebel. Um, we talked about this before, talked about this before, um, the boondocks, that is, and some of my general comments. Yeah, as, and particularly, I wanted to bring this back up because over the past week or so, I guess since we did that program talking about the boondocks, I watched some of my favorite episodes, and uh, I'll share with you all some of my favorite episodes. I have like 10 favorites, no particular order, but these are my 10 favorite uh, boondocks episodes, um, no particular order. I'm just naming them all so I make sure I get to, uh, make sure I get to 10. Um, <laughs> season 3 episode one. It's a black president, Huey Freeman, definitely uh, in my boondocks top ten. Um, Attack of the Killer, Kung Fu, Wolf, B.I., blah, blah, blah. Um, that is uh, from season two, season two. Um, the Uncle Ruckus reality show. That was one of the banned episodes from season two. Um, if you get the for season two, it's on there. And if you get, uh, if you go online, it's on as well. I sent it to, to somebody. Uh, it's all over the internet. You can find it easy. Um, a nigger moment, season one, episode four. Love that one. Stink, me Stink meter returns. He'll be back uh, season three. I, I think that's. Uh, I think that might even be next week. I'm not sure, but uh, he will be back. Stink meter. I think it's uh, the return of stink meter uh, haterocracy or something. But he'll be back this season. Um, the return of the king, season one, episode nine, with uh, the return of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, the story of Gangstalicious, part one. That's uh, season one, episode six. Uh, Catcher, the story of Catcher Freeman, that is from season two, and that is where the image uh, that is attached to the description of this program, uh, that's the episode that that image came from, uh, the story of Catcher Freeman. Uh, A Huey Freeman Christmas, season one, episode seven. Uh, Tom, Sarah, and Usher, season one, episode, excuse me, season two, season two, uh, episode two, and thank you for not snitching. Season two, I believe that's season two, episode three. But those are my ten favorite uh, Boondocks episodes that have aired. And uh, I was just 
seeing trends because I watched, I think I watched all of those episodes, all 10 of those in the last two weeks. I'd seen them all before numerous times, but I watched all 10 of those episodes. And just trends popped out at me. Um, and some of it we talked about before, but uh, I was just thinking, like, wow, the, the boondocks. Um, I guess, number one, I, I felt like they really don't attack white, well, I won't say attack. I won't say attack. I'll be, I'll be more precise with my words. They really do not aggressively call out the incorrect things that white people do in a system of racism, white supremacy, in the same manner that they explicitly call out incorrect and or buffoonish things that black people do. That was one of my observations. And I thought about that because I just wrote down a list of black people that I think the boondocks is making fun of, um, sometimes just making an overt commentary about uh, ignorant things that these specific black people are doing. And they call out names when it's black people. And so I made my list. Black people that I think they, they call out on the boondocks. I think uh, Rollo Goodlove, I think his character is uh, calling out Al Sharpton, and they've called him out by name before. Al Sharpton uh, did not like the Boondocks episode with Martin Luther King Jr. They felt it was disrespectful. Uh, and I think he also did not like the fact that they used the term nigger so much on the show. So uh, that's, that's one. Cornell West, he's actually animated in uh, the episode The Trial of R. Kelly. That's from season one, episode two. He's animated. He's at the courthouse when R. Kelly is going in um, to have his trial. Um, R. Kelly, obviously. Um, Soul Plane, I guess everybody who's affiliated with Soul Plane, uh, they pretty much uh, call them out regularly. Uh, I think rappers in general, um, they call out, I think, uh, both of the episodes, the story of Gangstalicious, part one and part two, uh, and uh, Thug Nificent's character. I think they, they spend a lot of time uh, poking fun and calling out a lot of the behaviors of a lot of rap artists. Uh, 50 Cent. Um, if you saw uh, season two, episode one, uh, he's in the movie, and, and they're kind of poking fun at him. Um, Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby gets kidnapped um, in season one. Um, I, I think they spent some time poking fun at him. So it's quite a few black people, out and I'm sure there are others. I'm sure there are others. Um, but I think there are quite a few black people, non-white people, that they call out directly by name. White people... I don't think they spend as much time uh, calling out white people directly for incorrect things that they do. Um, George Bush is one. George Bush is one. But I don't even know if George Bush counts because everybody, tons of white people were making fun of him. So it was, it was acceptable to bash on George Bush. Um, other than that, I can't really think of white people that they get at directly and call out for incorrect things that they're doing. Um, I guess maybe Ann Coulter. Um, she was she was kind of picked on in uh, the S word the S word where uh, Riley's teacher uh, said nigger and Rollo Goodlove comes in and, and all that they kind of picked on Ann Coulter a little bit but other than that they don't really call out white and at least in my view they do not call out white people in the same explicit explicit harsh manner that they call out black people, which is no surprise. Be very clear about that. No surprise. It's much easier to pick on R. Kelly uh, than it is to pick on some white people who got an army behind them. Uh, and BET. I forgot all about that. They're very explicit with BET. They did uh, two whole programs calling out BET, and they were calling out names in that one as well. Um, and there are, like I said, there are other black people that they call out explicitly and by name. Um, I just don't see that with white people. Um, I mean, they, they do talk about racism, white supremacy, uh, very overtly, much more so than I would say 95% of the, the programming that is on television. But that was one thing that I noted. Um, the other thing that I noted, and it stood out huge. It stood out huge. Uh, we talked about it last time. I think that was how the show ended when we talked about the boondocks the last time. And I am going to go to the phone lines. I see people called in. Thank you for supporting. Um, but they said, I think there's a little bit of all of the – I don't remember who it was specifically, but someone said, I think there's a little bit of uh, all of the Boondocks character, or I think there's a little bit of some of these characters in all of us. I think that was how it was phrased, I think. 
I think I might be incorrect. Um, and I said, ooh, <laughs> there's a lot of gay characters uh, on the boondocks. I, I hope not because there's a lot of gay stuff. And when I went back and I watched the episodes that I just listed off and others and others and tonight's episode, the story of Jimmy Rebel, uh, there is a lot of – I don't even know what to call it. There's just a lot of referencing of homosexual activity uh, on boondocks. Uh, it comes up all the time. Um, it's kind of put out there in jest as though, you know, this is satire. Um, but, I mean, there's so much of it. I mean, and like I'm a boondock fan, so I'm just going to run down some of the gayness that you see pretty consistently in the boondocks. Uh, you got Tom's character, Tom Dubois. I actually think that might be a jab right there, his last name being Dubois. That might be a jab either at uh, W.E. Dubois, which I suspect it's not, but I do think it could be a jab at so-called uh, sellout Negroes who have made it. White people have allowed them to get a few more resources and such. Might be a jab at, at Dubois' talent intent. Could be. I don't know. See, that's why I said I would love to have Aaron McGrew on the show. We can chat about this. Um, but Tom Dubois, right, his, his thing, and this, this goes all the way back to season one, uh, I'm not going to jail so that I can be anally raped. Uh, and they have a whole episode that is about this in season one, Date with the Health Inspector, um, where he gets arrested and the whole, he pretty much spends the whole episode um, crying and whining about being anally raped. Um, and, and I think they begin the episode, they have uh, a montage where they show him as a young child and he's watching television and he sees – uh, someone being anally raped in prison. Now, they don't show the footage. They don't show him actually watching TV to see the scene, but you can hear it uh, as they're, you know, showing you different things. Uh, Tom's anal rape thing comes up repeatedly. It's not just in that episode. Uh, it comes up repeatedly where he says, uh, not going to jail so I can be anally raped. That's even coming up again this season. They have an episode where uh, I believe he goes to jail again. Uh, I've already seen the previews of that, so that's coming back. That's one. Uh, the rappers, <laughs> the gay rappers, uh, that comes up repeatedly. I don't know if uh, they're doing another program this this season with Gangsta Licious, who is voiced by Most Deaf. But the story of Gangsta Licious Part One, uh, all I mean, rife with homosexual activity, uh, and they have the story of Gangsta Licious Part Two. Uh, where, you know, you've got <laughs> so-called gay rap. They, have, they started with two uh, gay rappers uh, who are talking about how they were real gay rappers, and they started this whole trend, real over-the-top gay images that they show with these uh, two gay rappers at the beginning. Uh, and then they show uh, Gangsta Delicious, who's in the closet gay, voiced by most deaf, and uh, they <laughs> in bed with another guy, and just way, way over-the-top with the gayness. Um, and they end up having uh, other black black males wearing pearls and skirts and just <laughs> real, uh, real, real effeminate clothing. Um, Riley ends up getting a lot of these uh, gay clothing items and such, and, you know, his granddad is, is – he goes from being furious to sad to just all over the place about – he thinks Riley's gay, so he's, you know, at his wit's ends about this. Uh, this is in the story of Gangsta Delicious Part 2 from Season 2. Um, and and uh, they incorporate rappers into doing this. They have uh, – if you watch Part 2, Thugnificent, uh, he wants to. Matter of fact, I, I can uh, I can play clips here because I, I have some of the. <laughs> they have songs and everything <laughs> to kind of emphasize my point with the gayness that's going on. Um, yeah, let me let me see if I can pull it up so I can I'll have uh, an audio aid to support what I'm saying about all this homosexual activity. Um, oh, see, my switchboard is acting a little little funky. Might be getting some interf Okay, got my switchboard back. Okay, all right. So I will play. Uh, the song that is associated with this episode uh, that I'm talking about, the story of Gangsta Delicious Part 2. Um, the name of this song, uh, Homies Over Hoes. That is uh, the name of the song. You 
never catch a lynch Full up with no beers Cause bitches ain't shit That's all my crew is sick Her bunch of knuckles He is high Oh, yes and yes Nigga, we hitting on them hoes Like we take the feds Bitch, can't you see? Fall back away from me Me and my niggas Just in the VIP Now bump it to the left Now bump it to the right Cause when you do the homie Nigga, I can do it right <laughs> Homies over hoes. That is uh, gangsterlicious. That is from uh, season two, the story of gangsterlicious part two. Um, so yeah, you have, and I mean to really get the full effect of that, you got to watch the video. You, they say uh, you got to see the episode because there's a video that goes with the song. So you got to get you got to you got to see the video to get the full effect of the gayness uh, that's going on here that that's being depicted in this episode. To get, I mean, whoa. Um, and, and so they have Thug Mificent's character and, and the whole, his whole crew, the lethal interjection crew with, uh, Flo Nominal and, uh, I think it's, uh, Mactastic and Flo Nominal. Those are the two guys. They are voiced by Busta Rhymes and Snoop Dogg, right? These are not just random folks. Those are the voices of these, the other two members of, uh, Thug Mificent, Thug Mificent's crew. Uh, Mactastic, flow nominal. Uh, they end up also being in this uh, <laughs> effeminate clothing uh, as the episode goes on. Uh, make sure you, you catch that episode if you didn't see it. Um, let's see. So <laughs> tonight's episode, tonight's episode, <laughs> um, tonight's episode, the story of Jimmy Rebel, season three, episode four. Uh, Jimmy Rebel, white guy racist country western singer uh and uncle ruckus uh they basically go out on a date they're eating ice cream they get an ice cream sundae and are eating it together um they're uh i mean i don't know if people got to see tonight's episode already uh you have to check it out but um i mean it, they basically go out on a date basically i think granddad even makes a joke about you know what are you doing ruckus this sounds kind of gay uh, he says sugar in your boots specifically, but, you know, this sounds kind of gay. Um, they, they have an awkward moment at the end of their date. They don't know whether they're going to hug and embrace before Jimmy Rebel leaves. Um, this theme is just very consistent. Even, even little things um, that they picked up with season three, uh, Riley, and it's already happened a couple times, but it's going to come up more. Just pay, this will be, you pay attention as season three rolls on. Um, no homo. So somebody, it, it happened uh, in season three, uh, episode two, uh, with uh, Thug Mificent, where his album doesn't sell and he has to get a real job. He ends up working at UPS. Um, several people make com I think uh, one of the rappers, uh, he says, I love Thug Mificent, and he says, no homo. Like, that's their new thing. Anytime a male character, a black male character, says something that could be interpreted as gay, uh, he has to say no homo. And if you don't say it, then it's like, oh, wait a minute, you could be gay. Um, I think granddad says something. Uh, some, I think he says he's going to give that man everything I've got. And Ra Riley says, oh, my gosh, that sounds kind of gay. you got to say no homo. And uh, granddad's like, you know, I'm not going to say that. And Riley's like, oh, you're gay, you're gay. <laughs> Uh, but this this is a runner. Like I, this is something that's going to be coming up repeatedly in the episodes. Having to say no homo, um, but just as a joke, right? It's a gag. And I guess I'm saying all this, all of this gayness, right? Is presented as I don't know what. I don't know. I mean, it's presented as satire, right? They're presenting this as satire. We're making fun. Um, at some level, that's what they, I mean. That's what they say at the beginning of the Gangsta Delicious episode. They say this is just satire. We're just having fun. We're not talking about anybody specifically. But there's a lot of this, this gay 
material in the boondocks. Like I said, it's not just one thing. I mean, this is repeated over and over and over. The the Tom Dubois thing with the ga- the anal rape in jail, that's coming back this season. Um, Gangs Delicious, I don't know if he's coming back this season, but they've already done two episodes with that. Uh, the episode tonight, the story of Jimmy Rebel, it just, it comes up repeatedly, and at some point, uh, I have to, I mean, again, I have a psych degree. Um, it's almost like when a white person consistently says, hey, I'm not racist, I'm not racist, I'm not racist. Well, why do you keep saying that? Um, with the boondocks, I don't know. Um, it could be that Anne Magruder and the people that work on the boondocks, that they see a lot of homosexual activity uh, amongst black people in this area of the world. That could be true. Um, I don't know. It's just I just find it very interesting that it, that it comes up so often, and particularly – when I tie that with the fact that you really have an absence of black females in the boondocks. We touched on that a little bit last episode. Excuse me, last episode. Um, you really don't, don't have any black female characters in the boondocks. It's, it's pretty much all black males. Uh, Sarah Dubois, that's Tom's wife. She's a white woman. Um, Jasmine Dubois, Tom's uh, offspring, um, Tom and Sarah's offspring. Uh, but you really don't have black females uh, presented in the boondocks. And it, it really stood out to me when I watched some of my favorite episodes how female characters are uh, represented. I mean, it's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, at the attack of the killer kung fu wolf, uh, that's from uh, season two. Um, black females, um, you know, <laughs> they 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 – they're lying on Facebook about what they really look like. Uh, you finally get one who doesn't, and she's crazy. Uh, she's crazy, long history of abuse. Uh, you know, you, you don't want this crazy heifer. And she kills herself at the end of the episode. Um, the Gangsta Delicious Part 2. Um, the video for the song that I just played, um, in that video, you got females. One of them, uh, Gangsta Delicious, he, he shoves the female uh, down on the ground in the club. It's real dramatic, played out in slow motion and everything. Um, the uh, season one, uh, episode three, uh, Save a Ho, uh, Granddad uh, ends up being with this prostitute. Um, it's just the representation of female. I know some folks have said they don't, they don't like Gus, they don't like cows. Uh, he's, you know, not supporting females or doesn't believe in sexism or whatever. Um, I don't know if you watch the boondocks. I mean, they are right rough uh, in their representation of, of black females on the boondocks. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what's behind that. Uh, it's, it's just very strange. Um, in particular, and I guess I would join this with uh, all of the gay humor satire in the boondocks, um, the fact that, you know, Huey and Riley, and I, I hope I said this a lot when we talked about the boondocks before, that they are voiced by a uh, black female, Regina King. She's voicing both of them, which that in and of itself is nothing to nothing startling. I mean, if you have uh, children in animation and cartoons, it's not uncommon that a female will voice a male child character in animation. Bart Simpson is also voiced by a female. Nothing in and of itself too crazy there. But in the context of white supremacy, in particular in the context of this, of this cartoon, where you really don't have uh, black female characters, uh, and in the context, as I said, I think, and I could be wrong, I've seen other people who comment on the boondocks, and they, there's some level of agreement uh, that Huey is, that's Aaron Magruder's voice. Uh, if that's true, uh, and it might not be, but if Huey is Aaron Magruder's voice, what does that mean to have that character, uh, the character that's supposed to represent Aaron Magruder, a black male? Not only is this not this not only is this not a quote unquote man; it's a child, uh, but it's a cartoon, an animated child. It's a cartoon, and it's voiced by a female. Um, I, I mean, I really feel like we're tiptoeing around some emasculation there. Um, in a big way, and I just saw this recently, uh, Regina King just had an article where she was uh, advocating that black females, quote, unquote, date outside their race. Uh, if anybody didn't see it, I got it in my email, um, but I just saw this, and I was just like, wow, that's, I found that very interesting. Um, 
yeah, I'll, I'll pull it up right now and uh, and read more specifically to see uh, see exactly what she said. Give me a, give me a hot. I should have had it pulled up already. Please forgive. Um, but yeah, she she just this was real recent where she was saying she was advocating this. I don't know uh, what sparked it, but I mean that that ends up being relevant. The people that participate in the boondocks, if they're making statements of this nature, very interesting, very interesting. That has an impact that, you know, that's something that uh, I want to know. As I was saying before, when you, when you read a book or when you watch a film, you want to get more information about who's participating, the author, the actors, the directors, getting more information that, you know, gives you more context uh, to what's going on in the show. Um, <laughs> just different things that you see. Okay, I got it. Yeah, Regina King, date outside your race. I'm pulling it up right now um, to see exactly what she said. Um, oh, man, they got a picture. <laughs> oh, man, they got a, uh, they got a picture of a black, black female with a uh, white man. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, I-, I can read it from you right here. Regina King who was married for almost 10 years to her son's father, is speaking out to her fellow black women, advising them to try dating outside their race. She explained her reasoning to Vibe, Vibe magazine. Of all groups of, of people, black women are the least likely group of women that will date outside their race. When you have everyone else who is willing to explore, a black woman is like, I want a brother. Well, if the brothers are out, and they're open to date everybody, and the majority of black women aren't willing to look twice when a man outside their race is sending them messages, then that makes our percentage rate lower and the chances of finding love because we're only looking in one specific place with black men. Every single one of my girlfriends won't date men that aren't black. I have maybe about five And these are people that I'm really considering my friends, not people that are associates or that you talk to or deal with at work. I have about five black friends who date outside their race. But all the other friends of mine, it's either they vocally say that they won't or every time an opportunity comes up for them to date outside of their race, there's some excuse why it's not going to work. They never really say it's because he's white. Oh, very interesting. Didn't, didn't, we weren't talking about Asians. We weren't talking about uh, so-called Latinas. White, very interesting. Anyway, they never really say it's because he's white or because he's Spanish. Oh, okay, there we go. Spanish or something like that. It'll be more like, well, you know, he works at such and such, and our schedules don't match. But we'll know really what it is. It's because he's white. Oh, see, <laughs> Spanish dropped out. It's because he's white. It's more common here on the West Coast. I think in New York you find more black women that date outside their race, but in L.A., not as many. I think black women need to open up. A lot of black women still carry a lot of pain when they see black men with women who aren't black, and that's really unfortunate, and that could make, that, that could make us so upset. It has to do with self-esteem. With women on a whole, what a man thinks about us means so much to us. Does he think my hair is right? Does he think I look right? Does he think my behind is big enough? Does he think my boobs are big enough? And nine chances out of ten, that man didn't even give a whatever. He couldn't even tell you what you had, that you had a pimple that day or that your hair wasn't done. Most men don't even uh, expletive. Uh, and the men that do, that are really paying attention, that hard to paying attention that much to your expletive or expletive uh, or exterior stuff, that's probably not the best person for you anyway. One of my friends was asking me if I would set him up with one of my friends, and I asked him, what do you like in a woman? And his first thing was exotic. I'm like, what does that mean? Um, I don't know if that's the full article, but... Uh, Yeah, there you go. Regina King, voice of Huey and Riley from the Boondocks. Uh, Again, I just found that very interesting, Uh, and it is relevant. She, you know, she's part of the cast, and that was her comment. I think she's more, I think at this point in her career, I couldn't tell you what film uh, she's been in of late. I know definitely uh, Poetic Justice, um, (laughs) uh, Jerry Maguire, uh, Enemy of the State. She's done a lot of big blockbuster films, but last five years, I couldn't tell you. I know the boondocks. 
the boondocks. Um, but yeah, at any rate, so getting back, like I said, females, they're, they're treated really rough. You don't really see black females. You don't really see black moms. You don't see black couples uh, in the boondocks. You know, Hugh and Riley's parents aren't there. Granddad's not married. Uncle Ruckus is not married. Uh, Tom is married to a white person. Um, you just don't really see black females in the boondocks. And I guess going back to what uh, Henry Macko said when he was on the program earlier this week, um, he was saying anything that is um, disparaging females, uh, anything that is encouraging any sort of conflict between males and females, that's going in the direction of homosexual behavior. And I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't see a lot of, of female representation on the boondocks and the female representation that is there. Uh, it's generally not very good. Um, not that the, the, the black males that are on the boondocks, not that they look good either, because they don't. Um, they don't, they don't, they don't. But the females, it just it looks really bad, and particularly since you don't have that much representation anyway, uh, black females. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just very interesting. It's very interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll segue into tonight's program because, like I said, this was front and center for tonight's program. The, the gay stuff was all over the place. It was like Uncle Ruckus and uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Rebel, it was like they were dating. Um, and and the, the story even acknowledges that. Granddad, like I said, he comes out and, and says that too, Ruckus. Um, before I share my thought or two on tonight's episode, and then I'll get the phone line so other folks, they can comment on what's been shared. Uh, or if you saw tonight's program, you can, you can chat about that as well. Um, I missed the sound clip. I missed the sound clip. Um, and I, it's relevant because, like I said, they, they do all of this. I think they consistently give commentary on hip-hop artists um, about them doing incorrect things, silly things, foolish things, uh, and a lot of it revolves around gayness. Um, they have brought in a lot of, of hip-hop artists who participate in the boondocks. Um, I know, as I said, Snoop Dogg and uh, Busta Rhymes, they were in that episode, uh, Gangsta Licious, the story of Gangsta Licious Part 2, where their characters that they voiced, uh, Flo Nominal and Mactastic, um, they're wearing all this, you know, <laughs> emasculating garb, uh, skirts and, and all this other stuff. Um, they also had a song, and, and again, to really get this, you gotta see, you gotta see this because there's a lot of visual imagery that's going on in addition to what's being said. But uh, they had "Will I Am" uh, season uh, season three, episode one. Uh, it's a black president, Huey Freeman. He did a song with uh, Thug Nificent. and uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and play it now. I can't say the name because it's got an expletive in it, um, but yeah, you can you can check it out. Um, this is late, so yeah, check it out, and, and, and if you did not see this episode, watch it. This is one of the best episodes of the Boondocks, and as I said, it's a lot of visual imagery going on with what happened, so uh, this is uh, Thugnificent and Will I Am. Got up this morning, things weren't working right I said I want to make a change, I said I want to fight Obama walked up and said yes we can I said I want to ride your nuts cause I think you're the man Now I'm big riding Obama, Obama Now I'm big riding Obama For tomorrow, dick riding for today, dick riding for the straight, dick riding for the gay, dick riding for America, dick riding for rock. It's okay to ride that dick, just as long as it's a rock. And now we're dick riding. Context of white supremacy, Gus T. Renegade, justice. Um, yeah, to really get the full effect of that, you gotta see it. You gotta see it because, I mean, there's there's a spot where they have a black male, and he's riding a rocking horse, uh, and it's got Ob the rocking horse has got Obama's face on it. I mean, just <laughs> whoa. <laughs> That's all I got. You gotta see it. You gotta see it. It's from season three, episode one. It's a black president, Huey Freeman. Um, 
And I guess I'll be very clear. Um, I am not saying anybody should be mistreated. I wouldn't care if you are engaged uh, in so-called homosexual activity. However, in the system of racism, white supremacy, I'm extraordinarily suspicious of why there's so much homosexual behavior um, being thrown at non-white people, why there's so many connections where people are saying, well, gay is the new black. That was an article that was on the front page of The Advocate uh, when Proposition 208 in California was going down uh, right during the election in 2008, during the presidential election. I'm very suspicious. I'm very suspicious, especially when the system of white supremacy has a long legacy of castrating and emasculating black males. Long history of that. And uh, with females uh, not allowing them to be feminine. Same thing, an attack on black femininity and masculinity. So I'm very concerned and very suspicious that so-called homosexual behavior could be the same thing. I'm not saying that anyone should be mistreated, just I'm suspicious. When I see tons of black males in dresses, um, I'm just, I'm very suspicious. I'm very suspicious. Um, the, the different programs and such that they have on television, I ask questions. I ask questions. And especially when I have concluded that black males who are less masculine, uh, when they show that they have been emasculated, that they are treated better, it's easier for them to get jobs, easier for them to get resources. Now I'm especially suspicious. So I want to be very clear about that. But if anybody, if they don't like that, if they think that's an incorrect stance, I don't care. I'm a victim of white supremacy. Uh, that's my conclusion. I could be incorrect. Let's chat. We can talk about it. Uh, but tonight's episode, the story of Jimmy Rebel, I'll make a comment or two, and then I'll open the phone lines. Um, I was really excited about the episode, and then when I saw it, I was just like, man, I didn't like this episode that much at all. Uh, it had a few parts that I thought were, were kind of funny, but I just didn't, uh, I didn't find it that funny. Um, I don't know. I guess, you know, I guess for people who didn't see it, I don't want to ruin it for you, but basically it was, uh, it was pretty much what I said. It's what I expected. Uncle Ruckus, uh, he, you know, he hooks up, he gets to meet this uh, – racist white supremacist uh, who's a country western singer and he makes all these songs about uh, how dumb and stupid black people are, calls them niggers, coons, spear chucker, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, they hook up and they just, you know, they, they sing nigger songs most of the episode and they go out on their date or whatever and uh, they end making more, you know, racist songs. Uh, this guy, Jimmy Rebel and uh, Uncle Ruckus. And this character, Jimmy Rebel, is based on a real, per a real person. His name is Johnny Rebel and he does make songs. He's made songs about uh, President Obama being a nigger and all this stuff. Uh, you can Google his name, Johnny Rebel, based on a real character. Um, but yeah, I just I didn't I, I didn't I just didn't find it that amusing. Um, it was just I don't know. It just seemed like uh, the whole episode was just lots and lots of uh, nigger songs and and nigger jokes. Um, I just uh, it just didn't do anything for me. Um, I guess if I had to relate it to uh, another episode, the Uncle Ruckus reality show, I love that uh, episode. I think that's probably my top five. I didn't is in my top five. Uh, I would say before uh, It's a Black President, Huey Freeman, the Uncle Ruckus reality show was my favorite episode, hands down. The reason I like that episode so much is because I feel like um, there was an underlying message. I feel like they were really making a strong comment about the programming that black people are subjected to on BET uh, and how uh, it seems to be set up to have a corrosive impact on black people. And it showed white people being in charge, ultimately. They did two programs addressing BET, and they did show that white people were in charge, even though it is mostly focused on black people. I already touched on that. But they do make sure that, you know, white people are running this. Um, but, yeah, it, 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 was, it was a lot of the same thing. It was a lot of Uncle – I mean, if you don't have a lot of Uncle Ruckus, it's going to be a lot of bashing on black people. Black people are stupid, blah, 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 all this. That's, that's his character, right? Um, but, you know, it, it, didn't, it, it did not seem to be 
an underlying message. There did not seem to be more to what was happening in this episode. With the Uncle Ruckus reality show, I felt like there was a lot more. You have a you have a critique of BET. You have a critique of black people and, and what we do. Um, just you know, I, I felt it was it was much deeper than just making jokes about black people. This episode, I didn't see where there was anything deeper than just you know the shock value. That was pretty much all it was, and and for me, that wore off pretty quickly. Like after. After five minutes of them singing all these nigger songs and nigger jokes, it's just like, okay, is is that it? That's all it's gonna be. It's like, oh man, that's that's pretty much all it was. Them them singing, you know, nigger songs and nigger jokes for the whole episode, basically. Um, I don't know. Now I'm I am ignorant. I am a victim of racism, and white supremacy. So it may have been that you know it was over my head. I'll go to the phone lines of people. If you saw tonight's episode, you can share, enlighten us. If I missed it. Please let me know, but I, I just did not see it. Um, just didn't seem to be there. Um, you know, there were a few funny moments, but I, I just I didn't really find it that funny. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't find it that funny, and it was kind of homeward erotic. It seemed like you know Gus and, and Chippy Rebel were were dating or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, I was disappointed. I was disappointed. Um, shouldn't have had my expectations up, I guess. But yeah, I, I didn't think it was. Uh, I didn't think it was that great an episode. I, I thought I would say of the four episodes that I've seen of season three thus far, this was my least favorite, hands down. This was my least favorite episode. Um, yeah, I think all the other episodes that I've seen of season three thus far, and I've seen them all. Um, I watched them, I think, two or three times immediately. Like as soon as I, I, I download all the episodes so I can uh, see them before they actually air here. I downloaded it, watched it one time, and I, I didn't even watch it all the way through the second time. I was doing other stuff. I was checking my email, and I didn't even finish it. I mean, I was just very disappointed. Um, yeah, very disappointed. Didn't think it was that great, and, uh, you know. What can I say? Uh, I'll open the phone lines up. I do want to play Mr. Williams' commercial. I don't want to slack on that so uh, folks can check out counter-racism.com. But as soon as the commercial is over, I will open up the phone lines, and you all can share your thoughts. We want to keep this one focused on the boondocks. And, uh, yeah, we'll be right back. Context of white supremacy, Gusty Renegade, and justice. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? At counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Yeah. Context of white supremacy. I'm going to give out Justice's email address really quick before I hit the phone lines. Uh, justice.asap at yahoo.com. Again, justice.asap at yahoo. Dot com. You shoot her an email. She would appreciate it. Uh, I thought about it even just over the commercial break. I thought about it. I think, yeah, going back to the letter that, uh, or I guess whatever, uh, Regina King had to share. She's a victim. No beef with Regina King. Um, I think any non-white person uh, who comes out and makes a statement saying that uh, black females or anybody, any non-white person should be dating outside their race, I'm just, uh, henceforward, I'm just assuming that they're talking about white people. I just assume, unless they say specifically they're talking about uh, so-called Asian people, so-called uh, Latinos, uh, Native Americans, whoever, unless they say that specifically, I'm assuming that they're talking about white people. 
I'm just putting that down uh, henceforth forward because I've heard other folks say that as well. So, yeah, that's my thought on that. Um, I'm going to the phone lines. If you called in, uh, your line is open. Uh, again, want to keep this one on the boondocks. Or I guess, I guess, yeah, the letter that uh, Regina King penned, if you have thoughts on that, you can share that as well. But things we talked about, the boondocks, I'd like to keep it phrased there. But everybody that called in, your line is open. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. I believe Mr. Nero got you loud and clear. Hey, greetings, guys. Yeah, I thought the uh, show wasn't as funny as uh, I thought it would have been. Um, but I have a sneaking suspicion that um, white people who watch the show uh, may have enjoyed that episode. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why would you say that? Um, there were certain references and certain uh, uh, imagery, um, like the city that they were in. What was the What was the name of the city again? Uh, Spoken Hoke. Right, Spoken Hoke um, was like, in, in my opinion, an all white town or city, and um, you know the uh, there was a wasn't there a large water tower when you first entered the city. Uh, that had that had something had something on it uh, that said nigger something. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, sending a clear message. You know, if you were black, <laughs> if you were a black person and you were driving, you saw that you turn around right away. <laughs> I mean, you would do an automatic U turn. And so uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that uh, they may actually enjoy that episode. Uh, even the reference to, uh, and I hadn't heard that term in a long time. I've said it, but I have not heard the term nigglets in a long time. <laughs> mm. yeah, that, that's just not one you hear every day. They they pretty much let all of the uh, the racial slurs fly in this one. Uh, the images yeah, they, uh, they they let everything fly <laughs> this, uh, this episode, uh, particularly the CDs that uh, Jimmy Rebel did when he was sliding them under the door to Granddad. Like uh, the images on some of those was pretty uh, <laughs> pretty out there. <laughs> I agree. And about the letter uh, that you read off. Uh, interesting phrasing of uh, her husband. I mean, it, hmm. it implies it implies the way you know the way it's read is if um, that they had the child first, and and then eventually got married. Hmm. Let me go back so a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, I just, you know, when you read it off, you didn't say her husband. And and their child, you know what I mean? Let's see. Okay, I got it again. I can read. It said, it's, uh, Regina King, who was married for almost 10 years to her son's father. That's it, to her son's father. I thought that was an interesting phrase. Yeah, that that is, that is strange phrasing there. Yeah, that's, that's, that's unusual phrasing, I think, to reference a couple that was married and, you know, had a kid. That's unusual phrasing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I guess he didn't want his name to be spoken because uh, they said they broke up, that he was physically abusing her, that he was on drugs, and he was sleeping around. That's all black men, isn't it? Hmm. Oh, this is Regina King's husband? Yeah. I think his name is Ian Alexander. Yep. 
Oh, uh, greetings, Gus. Greetings, and, uh, Mr. 909. Nero. Yeah, um, yeah, I was excited about seeing this episode and uh, went to a friend's house. It's all late and stuff, but I don't have no TV, so I wanted to see it because I've been hearing about it from the show. And I'm sitting there watching <laughs> <laughs> oh man! And one of my uh, associates—they're just neighbors, you know—and uh, his his he has a um, white girlfriend. She wasn't. Yeah, she wasn't there though. She wasn't there, and um, oh man, it was just it was it was just weird. Like it wasn't no laugh factors. Uh, on the show, and um, yeah, I have a. I like what you said though when you were giving your commentary and stuff. When you, you know, I'm sus- I'm very suspicious too. Like, it's a lot of gay. You know, even when um, uh, even when Riley came out the shower with that shower cap on, <laughs> he looked gay. You know. Mm-hmm. I, that's mm-hmm. what I thought, and I can say this too: when uh, him, when Uncle Ruckus and Jimmy, the, Jimmy Rebel, when they were eating that um, ice cream, I thought the punch. I thought the punchline was gonna be that Jimmy Rebel was was gonna try to uh, try to uh, do something to Uncle Ruckus. Yeah, that's what I was waiting for, the impact, you know what I mean? I'm like, what's going on here? I said, oh, they're going to make Jimmy Rebel a, ho- a homosexual. And he's going to try to grab and fill up uh, Uncle Ruckus. <laughs> it was like this, like uh, riding some kind of ride, and uh, their hands were outreach, almost like they was holding hands, you know, spinning mm-hmm. around or something. I mean, for me, that would have been... That would have been uh, what would you call it? That would have been impactful for me. That would have, that's that's kind of what do you the expectation uh, for me? Not the expectation, but the gratification of the whole thing would have been to find out that this dude, you know, Jimmy Rebel was a was a homosexual. I thought that was going to be that would have been the joke if I was writing it. That's what I would have did. I would have had Jimmy just come, you know. He he hating all he hating on black people. So and then to find out that, you know, yeah, that's what I would have put right there. But I guess, I guess Aaron is. I guess he didn't want to go there. Hmm. Yeah, I, that scene you're talking about where they're. Uh... They're eating the Sunday together, which I mean, I just find that very, uh, <laughs> very gay. Um, I mean, I'm not even if it's a female, unless you know, I'm interested. I'm not eating out of the same Sunday with another female, much less another male. Um, right. And when they zoomed in on it, it had the nuts on top. Did y'all see that? Um, I didn't think that was a, a coincidence at all. I thought, you know, uh, Doctor Welsing, ding ding. Um, but I did. I forgot to. Um, the, as I said, the gayness. This is this is perpetual in the Boondocks. Um, season one, episode fifteen, Passion of the Ruckus. Um, the black male that's on death row. He gets out of jail because Huey blackmails him and sends a letter saying, "I'm going to expose your gay lover." And he calls, and the guy's name is Raul. Uh, the white governor, he calls him and says, uh, you know, our affair is over. We got to end this, Raul. Somebody found out. And he he pardons the black male, and, and that's how that one ends. And just Riley, that's like, like I said, they have like con- this running jokes on the boondocks that are associated with homosexual activity. Uh, one of the new ones is going to be uh, no homo. Uh, one of the consistent ones has been Riley pointing out anytime somebody does something that he thinks is gay. Oh, nigga, you gay. Nigga, you gay. Uh, Huey sits next to him in the theater. Nigga, you gay. Uh, they go to jail, and one of the black guys is uh, complaining about you know, his gay activity, and Riley calls him. I mean, that's Riley's, Riley's line. He thinks everything is gay. Everybody is gay. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, 
like I said, like I thought about uh, 909, I thought about you when you were saying that there is no satire. All of this is presented as though it's, it's funny, ha-ha, it's just satire. I don't think that's the case because it's just it's too much of it. It's just too much of it. It's, it's enough that I'm suspicious, like, what is going on with all this gayness? And particularly, as I said, when you don't really have female representation on the boondocks, or at least it's very, it's very meager, and when it does pop up, it's like, you know, what they had in uh, – Attack of the Killer Kung Fu Wolf, you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the uh, like the rules of TV and whatnot, you know, as far as what you can show of the female body compared to uh, the male body. But I know on the Boondocks, there's, there's been several episodes where you got males naked, you know. But I ain't never seen like a naked female on the Boondocks, or even you know, top, bottom, nothing, you know. But I, I, I thought that was interesting too. I know. Uh, you know, on the on tonight's episode too, it's like uh, you know, when when, when Ruckus and uh, Jimmy Rebel was uh, hanging out, uh, I thought it was funny. You know, it was like uh, you know, Ruckus was trying to was trying to protect them, but when they ran outside to jump in the car, uh, Jimmy Rebel went through the door, but Ruckus jumped in the window, and, and they just hauled ass anyway. You know, he was he was still hanging out the window. <laughs> <laughs> Dukes of Hazard homage right there. I caught that. Yeah. Mhm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh. It's it seems pretty direct. It seems pretty direct, and yeah, they like you said they try and say it's satire, but it seems pretty. It's not. It's not. But I don't think people have did any study on it to understand that but you know i say it and and i've said it a couple times on the show and but i don't think any i don't think people really understand that uh uh uh, you know um it seems pretty misogynistic um homo homo homo, uh sexual um like you said, they don't uh, call out white people, so it seems pretty um, abusive uh, to black people. And that's not satire. That's direct. That's direct. Okay? Bam, it's on TV. It's coming at you. That's all it is. <laughs> Sorry. You know what I'm saying? It, that's it. That's it. Because there are ample opportunities for you to call out white people, you know, on some of their stuff. You had it. You had opportunities in the show to, uh, of tonight, this show, and it just didn't happen. Why not? And why, like you said, all of the, um, you know, the homosexual... Um, and it was some little, um, it was some little stuff in there that you had to catch because yeah, it was some little stuff in there that uh, in Uncle Ruckus's song, this one part he said that extra bone, that extra bone in their leg is good for jumping. And I don't know if anybody on this phone has ever, but I had a white coach tell me that he actually. Mm-hmm called out one of the white players and had us both jump um, to touch the backboard and told me the reason why I jumped higher than the white dude was because I had an extra bone in my leg. Hmm. That's wild. That's wild. And I just, and I was young, didn't know, I mean, I, I was pretty much, I heard, uh, my my grandmothers and grandfathers talk about white people, so I kind of, you know, already had a, a big a, a little bit of suspicion of them from hearing them talk. But that kind of um, onto what Pryor was saying too, that affected me. That I never forgot that. Like that's that's so vivid in my mind, and it and it affected my my play. It, it just I didn't want to play for the dude. You know what I'm saying? And I just, it, but I didn't know how to just get out of it. And I remember telling, uh, I remember telling a, an adult, 
and uh, and uh, they just uh, a black male adult, and there was nothing, no kind of uh, explanation given or anything that I was satisfied with. So that affected me that whole season. I just found that little bit there uh, when I when I heard that I said, "Think somebody's doing some research," because he pulled out a lot of little um, sayings that racists, you know, uh, and that uh, that that piece right there in particular that I just remembered because it happened to me, actually happened to me. So. Like, like I said, don't think white people are going to see it the same way. You know, it almost seems like the show was written for them. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Spooks. Of- <laughs> I'm just looking at the images now um, of the CDs that... Uh, Jimmy Rebel was sliding under the door, and one of them was Spooks of Hazard. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I would love yeah. to watch this episode with a white person to see what they laugh at. Um, yeah, and I guess I was thinking too. I'm, I mean, the Boondocks has a has a legacy. Like I said, at this point, like the cows have done over 140 shows. Um, I don't even think I could be evaluated on one show at this point. Like I wouldn't care if the show was the best counter-racist attempt ever or the worst counter-racist attempt ever, you know, you got 140 shows, you know, you have a pretty large body of work. The Boondocks has a very large body of work at this point. Um, I don't know. This is the last se- – I mean, this is supposed to be the last season, right? They said that, you know, up front, this is it, last season. Um, do you all think he could be pulling a uh, Pierre Delacroix uh, a la Bamboozled where wow. he's, you know – Forget it. Uh, this, you all have been messing with me. It took two years to get this out. Forget it. I'm just going to make the most racist, silly. Oh, it says niggers suck. That was what was on the water tower. It says niggers suck, and it was on Robert E. Lee Parkway. Um, but, yeah, do you think that could be it? He's pulling a, a pulling a bamboozle? That's possible. Right. And I was thinking about bamboozle. Today I was thinking, I said, man, I don't know if I should ask Gus to get some of those uh, sound clips from that movie, Bamboozle. I said, you know, he's already doing mad work, but I found that that before the show even came on, I was like, Bamboozle just just, just popped into my head, the part where um, the, all of the uh, Mau Mau's, they were in the studio, and Tommy Davidson was acting like he was playing the fiddle, and he was singing, you ain't never seen no nigga playing on no fiddle. <laughs> you ain't mm. never seen a nigga like that. Remember that part? And then what happened was one of the mouth Mau Mau started laughing, and most deaf got mad. He was like, what you laughing at? He was like, I'm sorry, son. I find it funny. I find it funny. He was like, yeah, you funny. And, and, but <laughs> <laughs> that scene right there just popped. I was like, man, they, they might have got me with this boondocks because Uncle Ruckus is like becoming my favorite character. I, I, I mean, I just I just felt that today. I was like, wow. I mean, they might have got me because I'm laughing at Uncle Ruckus, and he's I'm I'm more he's like my favorite character, and I'm I'm seeing that Aaron Magruder. I'm thinking that that's his voice. <laughs> Wow, that's it. Now, again, I, I've i long said, I think Huey, right? I've said I thought Huey is uh, Aaron Magruder's voice. I have also long said the per- the other character that is closest, in my view, to world view, political view on the boondocks is Uncle Ruckus. And they, in the first episode, uh, it's a black he- president, Huey Freeman, they end up being the only ones who are not jumping up and down about President Obama being elected. 
Uh, and, and I thought that was a real important scene. They come together at the kitchen table, and Uncle Ruckus says, it seems like me and you are the only ones that have any sense. It's just me and you. Me and He repeats it. He says it twice. It's just me and you. It's just me and you. And Huey gets up and walks away, and it happens again. But you could be right. You could be right. That could be, uh, you know, both sides of Aaron McGruder's personality. I don't know. That's a good observation, I think. Um, his CD is a Spooks of Hazard, Those Crack Babies, Nigger Stay Out of My Wife, uh, Don't Die, oh, oh, what is it? Oh, Niggers, Niggers Don't Die, They Just Smell Like One. Uh, don't let your niggas grow up to. N- don't let your nigglets grow up to be niggers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I almost NAACP myself. Uh, Welfare Queens, Cadillac Kings, and Coonsville. Those were the CDs or the albums. Hmm. Yeah, see, in this episode, they didn't miss anybody. Nobody came unscathed. They got black women, they got black children, I mean, they got us all on this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yep. I did find that part funny where uh, Granddad, when he was pretending to be the white guy, um, (laughs) he had to choke himself. (laughs) He was... He was choking himself to 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 talk like he was a, a a white guy. I found that imagery. I found that interesting. I was like, yeah, that's right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, 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 you feel me? It's like that 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 I found that funny. I actually laughed at that part, and nobody else really got it. I because I said, look, he's got to choke himself, and nobody was nobody. Um, they didn't laugh at that part, but I thought that I didn't. Uh, they laughed at other things that I didn't find funny, but I thought that part funny, uh, that he was choking himself to sound like a white dude. <laughs> I, I mean, think, uh, I was going to say to that, uh, that uh, fight or flight thing you was talking about earlier, it's like, uh, you know, victims in the, in, in the system, you know, really, you know, that's, that's the two choices. And then it's like, I think they made it pretty explicit, you know, very explicit in this episode that even if you're slighting or, you know, uh, like Uncle Ruckus was doing, trying to help out, you know, help out the white team, he he, he was still getting mistreated. You know, they they told him explicitly, say, hey, it's not your attitude, it's uh, just because you're black, you know. And uh, I thought that was that was interesting. They kind of did that on the, on the last episode, too, when... Uh, uh, what's the guy? The uh, uh, grandfather when he was uh, he he barely kicked the ball and then he started walking walking down the uh, uh, the first base and he kind of gave up but the little girl kicked him in the head anyway. <laughs> it's, like, it's like it's like dang. Um, so yeah, to that point of fight and flight, Uncle Ruckus. He don't want to be black. I mean, to the point where he made up Revitiligo. <laughs> He's got a, a, a imaginary disease called Revitiligo. I mean, he don't want to be black. You feel me? It's like who who would? It, and he took it, you know, to the to the extreme. It's like yeah, like he's serious about it because even when the white dude said uh, at that one part where he said, you know what, rednecks are stupid. Rednecks are stupid as expletive. And then Uncle Ruckus said, you ain't the racist I thought you was. We can't make no more music together. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, now that part I did find interesting because he said, I think it was when they re, or just it was close to that part when Jimmy Rebel, he says, uh, you are, he's something effective. You're whiter than 
most of the white people I know, or you're whiter than me or something to that effect. And I was just like, man, if you swapped white for racist white supremacists, works perfectly. And I was like, I see so many examples of that, but I, I thought that was great. I thought that was great, that part right there. And the ending where they go back to, to making, you know, racist songs. They're just talking about uh, Mexicans now. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a happy ending. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Which right. Which, yeah. I just don't understand that. Why why have a happy ending? Why not like you said, call out white people. They they, they or you see that I thought it was gonna end with him by Bonker Ruck is basically saying that uh they can't make music anymore, that he wasn't the racist that he thought he was and I was like, Okay, you know, wow. You know, that was that was more impactful for impactful than them making up. And all that. Yeah. And some of the names they called out was Alan Keys and Alan Keys and uh, oh, and he said, uh, "Are there any are there any more uh, niggas like you?" He said, "No, nah, but maybe Alan Keys and the nigga that shot Malcolm X." Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh man, this this is. And, and Nigerian, Nigerian. <laughs> implying that, implying that only a only a dead nigga is a good nigga. Mhm. I was just gonna say Nigerian monkey pox. That mm-hmm. was the uh, disease uh, Uncle Ruckus was supposed to have the white one. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know what I thought of when I was watching this? Like, I think I got about about halfway through it, and I thought, man, I would love to hear Oreo experience, <laughs> like, what she thought about this episode, because I was like, man, this is like some Oreo self-loathing. <laughs> like, uh, I don't even know what to do with this. Like, this is like maybe Oreo. She's a comedy writer. Maybe she came in and helped them write this. <laughs> Yep. I thought, it's, it, you know, when you said that he was doing like a Pierre Delacroix, um, uh, <clears throat> I thought that, he, like, 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 I thought, I thought that he, I said, well, maybe he's pissed at black people for, or BET or whatnot, or for, for, um, I guess some of the heat that he was getting from Al Sharpton and and whatnot, and this is some type of revenge, you know, him just saying, you know, forget you black people, whatever, for not supporting me, and so I'm just going to, you know, just just come at you with both barrels. I I, I did think that that did come to enter my head that that was a possibility. That he that he could be doing that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can only take so much. You can only take so much pressure. You, do you all? I don't know. Do you get the sense that uh, there's that much? Um, I don't just the black people that you all know. Does it seem like most of them support the boondocks, don't support the boondocks, um, just, you know, ballpark figure? Um, What's your sense of how other black people feel about the boondocks? Love it. Yeah, I think it's funny, you know, not really like a threat or nothing, you know. And few I'll go ahead. I'm sorry, Nero. I was just gonna say the ones that <clears throat> laugh at the boondocks, they watch um other things that like uh Medea and stuff like that that I I've never seen, you know. And I've always thought about that. That the way that they laugh at the boondocks is the same way they laugh at Medea. 
Like there's no, people are not at the water cooler analyzing the boondocks. They just laugh at the, you know, uh, black people being called. It's just, it's just, you know, that's it. That's it. That's it, man. It's like I haven't heard anybody offer any analysis of that um, of that show. Nobody said Aaron Magruder is really doing this thing. I'm talking about people in the entertainment business. You know, uh, Aaron, Aaron is doing his thing. He's really trying to get at these. Uh, you know, he's really trying to say something. Um, I'm talking. <laughs> Nobody. Writers, um, actors, comedians, um, lawyers, uh, school teachers. These are pe- people that the people I know, and not one has ever. When we brought up Boondocks and and and, and just come up in conversation, nobody's ever said that, and I and I found that a little weird. Yeah, the, the couple of blacks that I know, they won't watch the show that I socialize with. They will not watch the show. Any specific reason why? Uh, well, I'm, I'm assuming they've seen uh, at least caught one episode of it, and um, uh, they didn't go into any great detail other than, you know, once they heard the word nigga a few times, they were through. Are they, um, like, people over 30? Yep. Mm. Yeah, I definitely think there's a a big generation gap. Well, I suspect there's a big generation gap with the boondocks. I I don't know. I just find it hard to believe that you would have a lot of people that are, like, you know, 40, 45, uh, sitting around watching the boondocks. It could be. I just, I strongly suspect you're not going to have a lot of people that are, you know, uh, significantly over 35, I would say, watching and fans of the Boondocks. Now, now let me ask you, the, which one do you think, um, between the Boondocks and a Medea film, which do you feel uh, sells the image, imagery of homosexuality more? Or promotes it more. Tyler Perry in a dress or, or the boondocks? Tyler Perry. Yeah, Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry, okay. How come? The dress with the, with the lipstick and wig and, you know, acting it, all that. But they're 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 different genres. See, you have Tyler Perry; he makes uh, motion pictures, uh, movies. You know, motion motion yeah, motion pictures. See, that movie screen is no joke, and that television is a different animal. That movie is that movie is is is, is a lot more impact impactful. You know, but uh, like when you take church. Mm-hmm. So you think the Tyler Perry films have actually a greater impact? Yeah. I just think films in general, uh, I think they're in the same genre, the Boondocks and the Tyler Perry, but I think, you know, if the Boondocks was on the big screen, then I would say they're neck and neck. I mean that D writing. That's 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 that's, that's, <laughs> that's that's crazy. You know, I mean, wow. <clears throat> I've only what seen Im- it once. What impact do you think it has with Riley always putting down, uh, the, you know, the uh, so-called homosexual lifestyle? Does does he he doesn't. Uh, um, he certainly doesn't promote it, and in the in, in the scenes, I mean, he's usually putting it down. 
Right. It's what, it's, 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 I wanted to just bring out um, Little Wayne. That's where that's where they got that's where he got that from. Aaron Magruder. Yes, Little Wayne. Before he starts rapping in a lot of his songs, he says "No Homo." Mm-hmm. The same Little Wayne that was seen that was uh, has a picture out of him kissing um, another rapper in the mouth. Right. And now that I think, I think about, about it, uh, even Yui, no, doesn't Yui no, also put it down? Doesn't he put the lifestyle down in one of the episodes as well, I want to, in, in the second season? When Raleigh, <laughs> uh, the episode where Raleigh has on the little the little skirt, <laughs> and he's trying to appeal to him that, hey, man, you're acting gay. I didn't think he was putting it down. I felt like he was, because I, I just watched that episode, um, the story of Gangsta Vicious Part 2. Um, I felt like he was calling out the, just, it was such a contradiction. I think he was, he, right. that was what he was doing with Riley. Like, you know, you are constantly calling people gay and calling out things that you think are gay, and you're wearing a skirt. Like, what is going on? Because I think at one point he says, uh, you know, I like Elton John. He's gay, and, you know, so what? Um, I, I, that was my opinion. I, I, didn't, I didn't get the feeling that he was attempting to put down anybody for being gay. I didn't think. Hmm. So in the general view, you, I mean, do you feel they're selling people on the fact that this is acceptable behavior? What is what acceptable behavior? Homosexual behavior. Hmm. I mean, do you think that they are really pushing the message that this is acceptable? Um... My view would be that I'm not sure what you, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to feel about homosexual behavior watching the boondocks. Like, on the one hand, it seems that you have characters who come out and are blatantly opposed to homosexual behavior, don't like it, ridicule it. Uh, I've heard Uncle Ruckus, um, you know, make jokes about it. In that same episode, he's making jokes about it. Uh, Granddad is furious about it, sad about it when he thinks Riley's gay. Riley is constantly, you know, putting down people that he thinks are gay. But um, Riley gets roped up into it by me. By the end of that episode, Riley is in a skirt with a purse. (laughs) With a purse, I agree. You know, um, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, this is presented as humor. It's presented as satire, but I don't know. Is so much of it there even tonight's episode, they, uh, Ruckus and Jimmy Rebel, they're playing Twister together, and they end up falling on the ground. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I really have no idea. It's hard for me to tell exactly what they're trying to say about homosexual <laughs> behavior because, I mean, it's just all I can say is there's a lot of it in the boondocks explicitly, implicitly. It's there consistently, and they're very mixed messages. I'm not sure how you're supposed to feel about it. Interesting. Now, there's also a scene in tonight's episode uh, when they're when they're on their little when they're on their date because that's really what it was to me as well. Uh, what's the thing that they ride around? It's not a Ferris wheel, uh, or maybe it is a Ferris wheel. When they were when they were on, on one of the rides on the carousel, the carousel, on the carousel. On the horse. Yeah, right. If I can remember correctly, uh, Jimmy the Rebel was on a black horse, wasn't he? Yes, sir. And Ruckus was, was on the right horse. That's right. Riding a black horse, Ruckus was riding a white horse. Gay. Right, exactly. Yeah, I don't. I, I guess I was going to throw in quickly when you asked about the, what message is the Boondock sending about homosexual behavior. Everything that I said, I would have to add on to that, and you do not see any heterosexual relationships. Um, there are no couples. Nobody's married. You don't see any moms. Uh, that would have to be factored into, I don't know what they're saying about homosexual behavior because I don't see, 
I don't see any heterosexual relationships on the boondocks uh, with black people between a black male and a black female. So that would have to be added on to my commentary about the, the homosexual aspect. Yeah, I was thinking, um, cause, you know, when I when I uh, when I watch uh, <clears throat> movies, and I always think about the you know the production team, and um, I'm pretty sure, you know, if you had a guest on that was in the, uh, you know, in in the entertainment industry, any writer, anything like that, you know, uh, in, on any type of production, you, you know. That's something I find interesting is that it takes a lot, you know, a lot more than we just see, you know. It's not just Aaron Magruder in one room by himself uh, producing this this program. So there are a lot of influences, and most of them are white. And well, that certainly came out today. Yeah, and just influencing this humor. I mean, there's some things that, you know, that go down <laughs> that I just, I'm like, that's not funny, you know what I'm saying? Like, 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 I can't even laugh to make no money, you know what I'm saying? Like, this might cost me some money by not laughing at this foolishness, but I just can't do it. The things that white people find uh, funny, white males, it's like gay, gay gay humor that they like to laugh at. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I, I just, um, I just wasn't brought up that way to be, to even talk about him, talk, you know, so, yeah, he's, he's, he's around a lot of white people and that, that, I find some black people that, um, uh, are supposed to be, you know, heterosexual big time and, and, they get to they they end up laughing and joking and it's all gay humor, you know, with 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 with, with you implicating yourself that you could be gay. In within the humor, or or that you're okay with it, or um. That's, like you said, Gus, not so much okay with it, because like, I wouldn't vote against anything that had to do with homosexuals, you know what I'm saying? But I'm not for it. I wouldn't march uh, with... <laughs> I wouldn't go march with a bunch of gays either, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I'm not for it, and uh, you know, not at all. But I'm, I'm not trying to see them not have no rights and stuff or get abused, but uh, people... That guest that you had that said that homosexuality, is, like porn, is homosexual, and that I agree with that a hundred percent. I ain't. I, I gotta just say it. I agree with what he said one hundred percent. You know, we had a second. Go ahead, um, Nero. Sorry. No, no. You can finish your thought. Yeah, no uh, heterosexual relationships. That's gay. That's that's gay. No females. Uh, I mean, females getting abused in that homies over hoes video. You got a character called crazy bitch. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Female. Um, that's gay. Mistress. I'm sorry. You got the one female functioning like a tool um, of a um, uh, pimp named Slip, uh, Slickback when um, Tom trying to get uh, his his, uh, his uh, wife back and he got to fight the uh, the prostitute. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, long way she, uh, yeah. That was real interesting because that from that episode it looked like uh, the black female. Um, Sweetest taboo that was her name. Um, 
she's fighting Tom. She's beating him up, punching him in the face, cursing him out, calling him names or whatever, and Tom's supposed to smack her back. They had the white woman. She was on the computer. I think she was white. She was on the computer. She wasn't fighting. She was just getting information, uh, you know, hooking up things, breaking into people's uh, accounts, MySpace account and stuff. That was, uh, that was interesting, too. Mm-hmm. And we're supposed to we we're supposed to um, we're supposed to you know read more into it because we're giving the brother the benefit of the doubt and all of this the black male the benefit of the doubt and and and, and um, maybe past seasons um, but I mean it's kind of kind of blatant these days um, and maybe from the maybe from the beginning actually you know so. I think it's consistent I think yeah, it's, right. I think the, the gayness you know that's that's there from day one <laughs> uh, um, yeah I, I think it's a pattern I don't think it's anything that just popped up I think it's it's very consistent <laughs> Well, now, I guess let me ask you, before you were informed about racism and white supremacy, did you socialize with white males? White males? Mm. Hmm. Um. What? Oh. At, well, you know, uh, after, you work, a, after work at the bar, that type of stuff, or at, or at a, in oh. a restaurant. Um. You know, they always look yeah. to shit to work. Yes. When... I, I have to add an amendment. I did not grow up on the West Coast, so most of my life I was on the East Coast and well below the Mason-Dixon line. Then, no, I didn't. I didn't really hang out with white people very much. Um, since I came to the West Coast, um, a lot more. And I, yes, I saw a lot of what you're talking about. Though, let's go hang out. Let's go get drinks after work. Um, the more informed I became that, I mean, I don't, I don't hang out with white people. I don't really hang out, period, <laughs> but I definitely do not hang out with white people. So, yeah, when I was more confused, I did. Right. So let me ask you, because I have, too, when I was, you know, more confused. But one thing that would typically come up with them, when they discuss sexuality, they always talked about the joy of having anal sex, that this was like the you know, the highest form of sex with a woman because, you know, according to them, you know, it was much tighter, yada, 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 yada. Did they ever discuss these things when you'd be around them? I have not heard white males talking explicitly about anal sex, but I observed a lot of either very blatant, uh, homosexual commentary, homosexual jokes, even homosexual play, um, where they would be picking on one another and saying that this person is gay or um, kind of play wrestling in a very homosexual manner type of thing. So a lot of that sort of thing, just nobody, nobody talking about um, joys of anal sex with a female, but a lot of homosexual commentary and homosexual play with one another. I observed a lot of that. I've seen a lot of that as well. You know, I've seen that um, in a couple of different areas of the world, even. You know, white males behaving, you know, real comfortable as far as uh, talking about, you know, even playing, you know, engaging in. Uh, anti-sexual acts with each other and, uh, you know, or whether it be joking or even acting it out, you know, like, like uh, Gus was just saying. Mm. <laughs> Whew, man, it's deep. It's in their movies. I mean, the, uh, Henry, uh, Macko, that he was saying that exactly. He was picking out films where the guy said, uh, I think it was an Adam Sandler film uh, where he said, uh, would you rather have sex with Pamela Anderson or Jack Nicholson? Um, I mean, it's, it's all over their films. I, I was writing that. I was writing that on the board uh, before the program. Um, just the films that have pedophilia in them. Um, 
It's in 25th hour. It's in Heading South. It's in Hurricane. Um, it's uh, the, the films that they have about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Um, it's in V for Vendetta, even though that's with a white person and a, a white female, white male and a white female. Um, it's, it's just it's tons of that stuff. Uh, all the time. That's a big part of their humor. Broke back mountain. <laughs> Yeah, I have see, like, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Nero. No, you said I haven't seen that film. Oh. Yeah, Adam Sandler, Jack Black. Um, I've been in arguments about some of these, uh, you know, some of these movies that I didn't want to watch it. Like, I, I, um, they're, they're just, like, homosexual. They, they, you know, they're, they're taking off their shirt or they're in a Speedo or... Uh, there's some, you, you know what I mean, some kind of gay something going on. And I've seen enough that I know not to watch their movies, you know. It's like, no, nah, I'm not watching. It's not funny. Uh, I don't I don't find it that funny, you know. Sorry. I don't want to watch it. And then, because I know females, you know, they like they like that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, didn't, I don't like, I can't watch that stuff. So then now it's like, uh, I guess it's a, you know, I, I kind of got into some some little arguments about that. Arguing about, you know, black male, black female, arguing about, you know, Adam Sandler. <clears throat> and and uh, he's the main one, right? The main comedian that they have out. Um, Adam Sandler. Oh, what's the other guy with the big ears? Um, he's another Jew. Um... His father's in the movies too with him. The Fockers. Oh yeah, the no, Fockers. Ben Stiller. Yeah. yeah right. I forget I mean, the name, but I forget his father. His father's a popular actor also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they seem to love those 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 guys they love him they even say oh i love him i love him i'm just like man and they and they and they uh they clown black people in those movies too that's one thing that's consistent too and not just the homosexual piece but they have black people just looking crazy in those movies I, it's so deep now. The new Shrek movie got a black, uh, black, black. Um, it's an ogre, but you can tell it's voiced by a black male, and he's gay. <laughs> wow! You mean the character is gay? The wow. character is gay, and Shrek, hmm. and his name is Cookie, and he's the cook, and it's the black male, and and he is he is gay, and it sounds like, it sounds like. Um, the black the black guy that the, I, I I don't know if it's him or not, but this sounds like this the black guy that was in uh, it's hard out here for a pimp. Um, the the big brother the big the big guy. The, I don't know if you guys remember, but you mean hustle and flow. Yeah, hustle and flow, hustle and flow, and. It was the main character, the light skinned dude, and then the other guy that was helping him get his thing going. The oh, I know who you're guy. talking about. I know who you're talking about. Uh, that brother had a show on Fox for a little while. Mm -hmm. That's who it sounds like. That's that's yeah, like, the role. No, okay. Craig yeah, Robinson. That. That's the guy. <laughs> that's who plays Cookie in uh, Shrek. Craig Robinson. Craig Robinson. Robinson. Is that the same dude from Hustle and Flow? Uh, give me a moment and I will let you know. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's looking like he was not in Hustle and Flow, so. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. 
Oh, you talking about Anthony? Uh, that's Anthony Edwards. Yeah, yeah. Anthony Edwards. His name was on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. Is uh, Craig Robinson? Is he black? Yes. Okay. Yep. Cookie is straight gay. Yeah, Shrek. I was, I was like, I was, I was upset about it. You know, it just seems like wow, they just hitting us like, boom, boom, boom. You can't everything. You everything. You gotta watch it. You gotta watch foreign film to to get away from it. I mean, I love foreign films, but I mean, a lot of them don't have black people in it. You know, you just watching Asians or whatever. But they hitting us with all both barrels, man. It's just everywhere. I agree. That's that's. I mean, that's why I said I feel like there should be scrutiny. There should be uh, just thorough questioning. I mean, just the the films and and television programs that come out that are marketed to black people. I just don't feel like I don't feel like they've given us anything constructive and this this homosexual stuff. I, I got questions. You know, anybody, if you don't take offense about that, that's fine. <laughs> the thing that we should be most offended about is the system of white supremacy, though. Yep. I agree with that. What was what's the what, Winsler? Winsler. I was trying to think of his name. He's the he's the white guy that uh, I guess he's supposed to be the businessman or. In um, the last one where they were doing the uh, kickball game. Ed Winsler. Yeah. Yeah. Ed Winsler, yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, the gr- granddad was begging him, or or uh, dragged Huey to the park. <laughs> he he basically made Huey uh, play. I mean, he was he was bowing down to that dude like, whatever you want, sir, you know. He, he did. He he was doing his uh, his song and dance, and uh, yeah, I found that now interesting. That, now that character Winslow isn't he played by Ed Asner? Yes, I I thought the voice sounded familiar. Because he has an interesting body of work as an actor. Hmm. And if I can remember correctly, he typically has played a bleeding heart liberal in many of his roles, hasn't he? Not sure. Not oh. sure. What was the one show he did in the 70s with, uh, golly, wasn't it Mary Tyler Moore? Where he played like the liberal uh, editor and chief of the newspaper? You know, where he where he takes a chance, hires the female. I'm uh, looking right now. I can. I'm I'm looking at his uh, his resume. Um, he's been on television for a long time, so it's it's rather exactly. expensive. <laughs> Uh, now, I may have him like, with someone else, but I seem to remember him always playing um, a very liberal uh, person in, 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 on those shows. He was on the Mary Tyler Moore show. That is correct. Okay. Uh, it's looking like his character was uh, Lou Grant, uh, and it looks like he was perhaps in 167 episodes. <laughs> um he was also in Roots. He was the one on the slave ship who uh, they got a belly warmer for him, and he was upset about it. That's right. I forgot he was in Roots. Hmm. Oh, they got a belly warmer for him, and he was upset about it. Mm-hmm. 
He was like the the slave master who had a conscience. Um, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! If somebody had the time to uh, like do background checks, like when you were talking about um, Sigourney Weaver, it seem it, it does seem like uh, <clears throat> these people. They have, uh, um, I guess, what, you, what would you call it? They have a, uh, they're typecast, or, or they seem to play similar roles in, in different movies, you know. And I think that that's interesting too. I don't know if it's because, um, what I was thinking, just like, um, I guess this might be a little off topic, but uh, Damon Wayans, and hit. hit him, him playing uh, Delacroix, and and I remember somebody asking me like, why did they? And it was a lot of it was a big beef uh, between him and Spike Lee uh, over that movie. Damon Wayans didn't want to advertise for the movie, do interviews for the movie. He was upset about this and that. And Spike Lee basically was saying that he cast him for that role because that's kind of how he saw him. You know, and I thought that interesting that people aren't being people are being cast for their own like like they're supposed to be acting, but um, I don't know. It's just weird. Uh, it's weird. Hmm. Okay, so I wouldn't. I don't. If if anyone had said that about me, if I had been Damon Wayans in that situation, I would have asked him uh, which black people uh, does Spike or anyone, which black people are not in the position of Pierre de la Croix, where they're having to do what white people want them to do, particularly if they're acting. Point out the black people that you think are not doing what white people want them to do, and if that means taking degrading roles or what have you, pick out those black people, please. Right, and and one, yeah, I would agree. Big them out. Maybe that's why he didn't want to go do the, um, you know, the talk show uh, circuit. You know, yeah, he definitely was upset. Yep, he was definitely upset. So, oh, speaking of that, back to most death playing. Um, Gay rapper, and you know Snoop Dogg um, and Busta Rhymes, you know, having on, uh, and even in the comp, even in the, uh, even in the, um, even in the, uh, what they what they were saying was, you know, kind of, you know, gay. Like Snoop Dogg said, "I'm gonna keep these pearls, man. These is kind of fly, you know." You know, after they found out that. Um, Gangsta Licious was gay for real. He said, "But these kind, of, but these pros is kind of fly, you know. I'm gonna keep these." And it was yeah. Gangsta Licious. Uh, it was his line of clothing. It was his line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, that's why I said it's hard to. From the messages are so mixed, it's hard for me to get a grasp on what they're really what they're trying to say about this. The gay stuff, because I mean, like Riley, he's always calling out, you know, you gay, you gay, you gay, but you know, he's got a purse and a skirt, and his, you know, his hero, Gangsta Delicious, is gay, and he's seen him kissing another man, male, excuse me, uh, and he's in denial about this, um, like you know, uh, he he's not really gay. They kidnapped him. I was dreaming, you know. They hit me on my head. I was dreaming. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's very, it's just very interesting. It's very interesting trying to get a grasp on exactly what's, what's going on with all this, uh, all this gayness, and especially because there's so much of it, uh, prevalent in the in program. <laughs> yep. And interesting think- enough, Riley... Or uh, you, neither one has a, a, a friend even that they talk to uh, that's of the opposite sex that's black. I don't even believe I've even seen him talk to a you know a, you know a female a black female 
in their age group. What about in the, uh, in the uh, comic strip? Do they? I don't. I haven't. I haven't followed it in a while. Is there any black females in it? I don't remember any. I can't say I, I followed the, the comic strip as faithfully as I have the television program, but I don't. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> I think there are more characters in the television show than the comic strip. Now, I could be incorrect, but I think there are a lot more characters in the in the TV show than the comic strip. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when you create, I create. I mean, I've been in situations where have, you have to create characters and superheroes and stuff like that. I mean, I've never just not had a a strong uh, I mean you know a, a female um uh, in my character development it's something I think about all the time like what um what they should dress like what their hair should be like um should I make her you know red bone uh dark skin I mean so for him not to just have no either a, a young a young a girl or a woman in his in his character that just is that's that's to me uh, I, I don't know how to say it but it's just it's, it's interesting you know you sit down and you start developing characters and you don't put um, and he's a you know he's a black male so you know say a black female <laughs> you know a black female character that, you know, black women can, when they turn, when they tune in, I guess that's where Regina King comes in. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, if I'm a, I, I mean, that's just real interesting. If the female, black females are supposed to relate to Regina King via Huey and Riley, that's very interesting. <laughs> Especially with that article that you that you had read. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Woo! Man, you're talking about the mind of victims. It 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 it's a uh, uh, wow. <laughs> I mean, just think about that for a minute. Black, I mean, that, may, that might not be the case. So I said I would love to have Aaron Magruder on the show. It would be great. You can ask him all this, and you can get it right from him. Um, but, you know, if black females, they're supposed to relate to this show through Regina King via Huey and Riley, and we are getting Aaron Magruder's perspective via Huey, who is voiced by a black female. Regina, I mean, that's just, whoa, like, what is going on here? Mm-hmm. Confusion. That's, I mean, that's a mind, uh, which we don't really know. But I mean, if you if you were to psychoanal uh, uh, do some type of uh, psychoanalysis, or if that's even possible, but um, wow. I mean, if something was to happen to to the brother, um, um, where he got into an accident, got you know whatever. Hopefully, hopefully not. But you know, just for, if something was to happen to him, um, where he died, and then people were to you know try to you know figure out you know just what was going on, you know all we all we all that we would be left with is these facts, you know this 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 work this body of work that he has, and. Uh, I don't know if he he probably doesn't care about that kind of stuff, like you know how people are just gonna look at it, but it's just uh it's a lot you know, and Toby Uncle Ruckus told him his name was Toby, that was heavy, <laughs> yeah <laughs> <It was> heavy. <laughs> I, mean, I believe. Like, I like, trust me. I believe white people all day use that term. Mm-hmm. Toby. 
Like he was trying to come up with a name that was gonna be most suitable to the white man. He's like, he's like, uh, uh, Toby. <laughs> oh man, we I've I've used that uh, I've used that to re- uh, refer to myself, and I know Gus, you've used it too, right? I right. believe so. <laughs> I believe so. You are not alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I found that interesting. Yeah, you know, we've all seen that it. Uncle Ruckus, you know, and and counter uh, races. Uh, we we you know we both use the term Toby when it gets down to the nitty gritty. You know what I'm saying? It's like you know, if you if you really want to know. Where I'm at with this, you know, just call me Toby around this piece. You know what I'm saying? What you say? Don't call me Kunta. <laughs> Kunta took a, uh, I mean, a monumental ass kicking before he became Toby. <laughs> They were watching that tonight, weren't they? Watching that on uh, on the when they had their date, Jimmy and uh, Jimmy Rebel and, and Uncle Ruckus, weren't they watching? Uh, it looked like a scene from Roots where uh, Kunta that, getting beat. That's I, where I, I, I mean, it's a lot of those flicks where you see a black person getting whipped, but it looked like a scene from Roots. I could be wrong. That's what I, I thought too. Said, but then I he said, 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 said uh, "I'm a star." Yeah. If yeah, I didn't remember a scene. From I don't remember that particular scene from Amistad. Yeah, me either. I, I know he said we could watch Amistad, but I don't remember a scene in Amistad where a black person is getting whipped like that. Yeah, I don't remember that either. I do remember seeing it in Roots, though. In several scenes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man, yeah, several scenes, but... Um... Toby. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want to make sure folks, if they're listening in, archives or whatever, uh, I'm not hating on Aaron Magruder. I have, I, I said repeatedly, I've watched the shows uh, repeatedly. I'm a big fan. I was rooting for uh, the story of Jimmy the Rebel all week. I've been telling folks, you know, watch it. I played the promo. Uh, I support the boondocks. I'm just, you know... Analyzing what you know, what I see. This is something I watch a lot, so I feel like I I should be able to speak confidently about this because I've seen all the programs thus far, and I've read quite a few of the comic strips. Um, and the picture that I got up, I, I do think that they do make an effort to jab at the system of racism, white supremacy. I, that that photograph, I mean, uh, I, I think they are trying to be slick victims pretty consistently on the boondocks. That that uh, photograph is from uh, season two, the uh, the story of Catcher Freeman. Um, they freeze on that shot. Like if you if you watch that episode, um, this is uh, the black female that's in the background. She's trying to escape. She's a runaway slave. And uh, Catcher Freeman comes in to save the day. He kills all the white people. And they freeze on that shot. And I was just like, oh, they're, they're being slick uh, to just leave that on screen for a while, uh, which is probably why this, this show was ending this season. But I, I do think they, they do little things like that uh, pretty consistently uh, on the boondocks. Yeah, that was a tight episode. Mm-hmm. One of my <laughs> favorites. One of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, slick. I, I, that could be right. You got to give them a little. You give them a little, and then, you know, yeah, then we'll get something like the Catcher Freeman. You know what I'm saying? 2010. <laughs> but, for, but, for, but first, you have to, uh, <laughs> you know, first you have to, uh, you know, do what you got to do. You know. Um, so, I mean, I mean, yeah, I am a good. I mean. I, a genius in his own right, because I mean that brother got had me laughing at a slave being whipped, which is oh, not yeah. supposed to be funny, but that is hilarious when that slave <laughs> is at whip and you know and screams out, you know. I mean it is hilarious. Shouldn't be funny. 
<laughs> yeah, he set you up. Oh. He set us up because he was a snitch, you know, and he was like, he didn't want to get free, so he kind of set us up for it. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. Yo. <laughs> oh, man. He said, Master's coming! <laughs> In fact, you know what? That's the only show, now that I think about it, where there's a black female love interest. Pretty mm-hmm. much, yeah. 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 Even close, even remotely close. I think that one and the, the one... Uh, well, I don't even know if that counts. I don't think that counts, but I mean, the only other thing that I think even gets close is uh, if we exclude... Uh, the Save a Ho program and uh, the attack of the killer Kung Fu Wolf, I, I don't think those count for a myriad of reasons. But uh, the one uh, Riley was here where he's doing the graffiti, and the last painting he does is when he puts the picture up of when uh, Granddad gets married to his wife. That's the last one he does. That's about it. You don't really have anything that even gets in the ballpark of, you know, a black male, black female relationship. Right. Mm, I don't understand it. <clears throat> like, what's funny? What's not? Uh, uh, there's a lot of funny things that happen in, in relationships that you can, you know, make just that. So, yeah, I don't know. Did you do any writing on the um, other episode with the kickball game, Gus? You said writing, I'm sorry? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, uh, not writing, but, like, uh, any thoughts or notes that you took down for that for that episode? Uh, I've watched that one a few times. Um, I, I thought that was a much better episode than the story of Jimmy Rebel. Um, I thought a uh, very interesting uh, global commentary on racism, white supremacy, where uh, you have, everybody brings up China. China's coming up. China's coming up. Uh, they don't have any muscle to make white people, a.k.a. Ed Wunsler, in this episode. They don't have any muscle to make him uh, give them uh, their money, you know, none, uh, which is the exact way that I see racism, white supremacy. Whatever money uh, they say that, you know, China, they, uh, we owe them, not excuse me, not we, but white people uh, owe them so much money, white people from this area of the world, uh, they don't have the military force to uh, make them give it up today or tomorrow or next month. Uh, I thought uh, real interesting how uh, Ed wants that he's able to manipulate things so that they're going to win, so that they still don't have to pay them. Um, white people still win. <laughs> they they get their whole little team of uh, mostly non-white people to go out and do what they want so they can win this game. Um, let me see what else did I, did I catch from that one. Um, Ruckus called them uh, yellow niggers. I thought that was hilarious, Ruckus. I thought Ruckus was way funnier. In the five minutes that he was in uh, the kickball episode, I thought he was way funnier than the program tonight, just uh, what what he brought to the episode last week. Um, Let me see. The Blackwater commentary on Blackwater when he brought the men to uh, to play kickball, I thought that was hilarious. Uh, when he brought the uh, the little non-white kids in to play as ringers, and then they got deported, I thought that was hilarious. Uh, that that episode has a lot of layers of racism, white supremacy. The kickball episode, a lot of layers on that one. I thought that was a pretty solid one. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I felt like they had a. Uh, they had uh, Huey uh, kind of supporting the team near the end, like after the whole crowd started singing, um, I think it was like, uh, Oh, America or something. Well, I forgot the name of the song. But then after that, he did his uh, power-up, and then, you know, it was like it gave him strength or something. Oh, yeah. That part gave me chills. That was a chilling part, that song right there and how that broke down. I was like, What? Yeah, I remember. I remember. Yeah, that was that was interesting right there. Cause I guess um, I don't remember 
exactly. But I just I do remember feeling like, wow, like this 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 they 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 this, the song played, and it was um, it was um, it was kind of like an anthem, like a motivational song. Yeah, that was that was that was that was weird. Yeah, it seemed like it didn't fit because uh, you know he was. Uh, Huey's character doesn't appear to be uh, inspired by such songs, but it seemed to give him a boost in. I still think in that in that particular um, one that they gave China a little too much uh, juice. I mean, he was kind of acting like a boss, like he was a boss, like he like he really had, you know, the muscle to to. to uh, you know what I'm saying? Get, and that's not true. So, I be, I, I, I kind of felt like uh, they gave China a little too much juice in that, in that, for for a little time. <clears throat> Interesting. Uh, China country has to block the internet from its people, but this is supposed to be this great power. Man, yeah. So just, 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 yeah. That episode was deep because if you know anything about China and what they're doing, just like you said there with the, you know, internet, I found it, I found it to be a very interesting episode. Just knowing a little bit about what's going on over there, you know, that place is, it's a like a man. That place is. It's illusion, man, and nobody's really telling the truth about it. So, I mean, the amount of money that they're spending to block the internet. I mean, Cisco, Microsoft, and several other companies are making a killing off of China right now. Just in them trying to block the internet. Mm hmm. Oh, man, you guys, there's a. Uh there's a website called uh, Current TV, and they do these documentaries called uh, Vanguard. Are you guys familiar with that? Any of you? No, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they do these documentaries, man, and I love documentaries. That's uh, that's the kind, of, you know. But anyway, um, they went to China. You know, they snuck the cameras in, you know, they couldn't, and they showed some of the, I mean, they showed some stuff that, and that's what they do. They do impactful um, documentaries where they go to places, you know, Colombia, and, you know, places that you, did, you know, you wouldn't really never see, Asia, you know, places in Asia you never heard of, and, um, yeah, they went out to China, man. Them Chinese, they had <laughs> them China. Whoa, man, it's it's going down out there. I just give you a little snippet. They have this one. They have they they sell they they sell dog fur for fashion. Like you can get a dog coat, a uh, dog fur purse, dog fur coat, and they had these dogs in these cages. Like you would see um, chickens or something, but there were dogs, and you ca- they couldn't barely move, and and so they they all cramped up in these cages, and they they were biting each other, and and I mean it was just like the torture. It was just it was, and this it was yeah it was that was just a piece of of what goes down out there, man. And what they were saying, they were saying well, I'll say, I'll say, no, the racists love to point out their human rights uh, issues that they have. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, God. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't even want to start on that. I mean, it's, they, 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 they doing some, whew. It's so off topic, but I guess we were talking about the Boondogs in the China episode. But yo, it's 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 crazy. <clears throat> He's talking about human rights. I mean, they organs, 
taking people's organs, selling organs. People from, and you know, black, uh, uh, non-white people aren't doing this, but you got white people going out there. They go to China. They get, you know, they, they, they can go out there and buy a kidney, buy a, uh, 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 you know, this and that. See, in America, they get put on a waiting list, but the, the, the wealthy, uh, whites, they, they, they go to China and break off some bread. And somebody comes in there for one thing, and they take it. They take their organs. Yeah, you get funny. a bread. Oh, you get a fresh kidney. Oh, right. mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's not funny, but yeah, that oh. I've heard uh, the worst areas that you go to, uh, where so-called Asian people are, the worst that that gets. Like uh, I've heard many folks say, you go to uh, poor areas, Thailand and stuff, that. Uh, people just wind up missing. They just snatch somebody and just harvest all their organs and stuff. They said that happens all the time. Real lucrative business. Uh, the further you go down, non-white people that have fewer access to resources, uh, that, that just gets real out of hand. And, I mean, you know it's got to be white people that, you know, are the ones who are, who are getting the organs that they've taken from these people that have been killed and they've cut them up or whatever. Yes. That's that's deep. Mm-hmm. I just yeah, checked. Talked about, about, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to ask him. They talked about how much money uh, Aaron Magruder has made off the Bunda. Does anybody know, uh, you know roughly how much he's made? No idea. That was no a good question, idea. though. Yeah. I would think Must if he's retained oh, I'm sorry, whoever. I was just gonna say, you know, they made such a big deal about Dave Chappelle and all of these uh stars what they're asking for per episode. It seems like somebody would have said something if he was getting buku 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 money. But uh I just don't know. I would think I don't. I'm sure some of it would come down to the contracts and who owns the rights uh, to uh, to the Boondocks and all that. I'm, I'm sure that would have a big to do with it. But I, I would think DVD sales alone would be very high for the Boondocks. Um, that seems like a a DVD set that a lot of people bought. So um, it seems like it could be very lucrative for somebody. I don't know how much of that money is is getting back to uh, Mr. Magruder, but. Uh, it seems like it's generating a lot of money because the DVDs I know are selling very well and, you know, three seasons in. Um, and, and the books are still selling, I'm sure, and all that. So it seems like it should be a very lucrative uh, franchise. Mm-hmm. I did, I to I did ask check some. Go ahead. I wanted to ask you how you felt. I meant to ask you before, I think, uh, the last Boondocks, but how did you feel about how Bill Maher was on the show basically clowning uh, Doug, uh, what's his name? Uh, Doug Nixon. Yeah. And he's got the cowbell. Yeah, I mean, I thought, because, you know, that's like a cowbell because Bill Maher is always dating these, these, these black women. And the fact that one of the black women that he was dating came out and said that he was basically racist. <laughs> that that she would that he would abuse her with racial um <clears throat> racial comments. Well, see, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Oh. I, didn't, I didn't heard anything about that. I, I know who Bill Maher is. I I've seen his show before, but I yeah, I didn't I didn't hear about this this black female that uh he was with who made made those. If anybody has info, story, anything about that, you can shoot it to me. I would I'd be uh, interested to uh, to check it out. But um, be, not being informed about that when I saw it, I just I hope I said <laughs> we talked about the Boondocks before, but I hope I said that uh, I have seen that go down um, on his show where he has had um, black guests. Um, I don't. Man, <laughs> um, I'm trying not to call names. I'm not going to call names, but he's had black guests on the show who were supposed to be very informed, professors, whole nine, uh, and I've seen entertainers. 
uh, go on his show, Black People, and pretty much exactly what happened on the Boondocks with Magnificent happened on the show. Where he just clowned on them and used words skillfully to make them sound stupid. Um, that, it, it seemed very close to what I've seen happen in real life. Mm-hmm. Man, <laughs> and he had the nerve to say to one of those black guests, I'm with you, I'm with you. Like he's supposed to be the hip white dude that that's with the blacks but mm-hmm. like you said i've seen him clown black blacks that came on there uh you know so yeah that was that's interesting i just felt like that was interesting because he's like a to me he he's a he's another um tim wise <laughs> <laughs> yep yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking, too, because I, I told people that I was so glad Mr. Nero when the last time uh, Timothy was on the show and uh, Mr. Nero had an opportunity to see um, Timothy live in person, and he was commenting on how the non-white females just flocked to him, and I believe Mr. Nero said it made him a little jealous. Uh, and I've seen the same thing. I've seen the same thing when I've seen Timothy live. Uh, and I told people that, you know, just being a white person – you make any commentary that sounds like you could be truthfully acknowledging how bad it is to be a black person in a system of white supremacy, man, that is game on top of game on top of game. It, I mean, that is magnetic for black females, and it works the same way. So if it was a white woman saying it, it would be the same way for black males. I mean, game over. <laughs> um, I mean, you probably get anything you want. Uh, from a black person in that situation. So I'm not surprised at all that for Bill Mayer, he's able to go out and date all these blacks. That's not surprising at all. I'm, I strongly suspect Tim Wise could be doing the same thing if he is not already. I'm not saying he is. I just suspect that that option would be available for him. He's going to all these college campuses with these young girls who are very confused, I suspect, about white supremacy. Easy pickings. And many of them very fine, I might add. For sure. Many. For sure. The ones that was flocking to him. Man, that's, like you said, they're good looking, man. Nice bodies and, and whatnot. You know, Bill Maher, like he said, he's got his, he's got his, um, uh, you know, he's got his, uh, he having his way. It ain't like he going out there getting no, you know, strags. I mean, if you if you were to look at the oh damn we we're way off, but if you if you look at the the white women that blacks, uh, so called stars get, and they white they're white women, and then you look at the black women that these that these white uh, it ain't even no comparison. It's like they get the we it's like the blacks get the. The, the the bottom of the barrel and the whites they get the cream of the crop. <laughs> wow, that's deep. Ooh. Anthony Pryor was talking about that uh, in his book. Um, he talked about that a lot when he was talking to these uh, uh, black athletes. He was he was telling stories just how he would he would sit down and. Um, talk to some of his teammates and they would be with a white person and they would be confused. He used that word a lot in the book, confused, confused, confused. And he would be like, uh, he would just be breaking down. Like he was, he was, he had a very good idea of what was happening. And he was trying to tell them like, do you think the white girl that you're with, do you think she would be with you if you were just a regular old dude, you know, working at, you know, the mall or wherever, holding down a regular job, making $25,000 a year, do you think she would waste her time paying any attention to you at all? And they just could not get it through their head, like, oh, I'm just a nigga with a lot of money. Got it. Like, they just, that that was not sinking in. They were not understanding they're still Toby. Mm -hmm. And I remember, um, shout out to, uh, uh, Lauren Ashley, but she was talking about that. That's very predatory. You already know that they 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 know that black men have this uh, um, thing for white women or whatever. So 
they know that they can capitalize on that, where it might be harder to get a rich white man if you don't have no um, education, you're just a stripper or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, you know, black men with money, they 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 prey on them. Mm. You know? Yeah, yeah. She, was, she was saying that. Vultures. I, I broke that down. I told y'all, pay attention to the metaphors. Um, or that's a simile, but same thing. He said that... Uh, the women, they, they would prey on black male athletes like vultures. I just thought that was very interesting because that kind of flipped it because I'm accustomed to it being the other way around where people talk about the black male athletes being the ones who are uh, preying on all these uh, females. But he, he had it the other way. He said that the women were the vultures uh, looking for their prey, the black male athletes. Very interesting. But like I said before, I have observed they are typically the aggressor, you know. But they're usually the one that makes it crystal clear that they're interested. You know, I have, I have not seen a black male in a grocery store just walk up to a white female and start talking to her. I haven't seen that. So um, it's been my experience. They are usually the aggressor. They usually make it painfully obvious that they're interested. Right. Obvious with um, instant sex. I mean, how how more obvious can you get right there? It's like, what you want to do? Like, bam, right here, right now, what's up? It's like, that's, that's, that's the end, that's the, that's the end game already right there. Right. They're prepared to do well, Ever. They, they make it painfully obvious. <laughs> In one of my experiments, I purposely didn't didn't make any comments suggesting it just to see how far she would go. And while I'm at her home working on the computer, she turns on some porn. I said, okay, <laughs> that's pretty obvious. <laughs> Now I'm trying to fix the computer, and she got porn playing. I'm going. This is pretty obvious. <laughs> oh man! And you basically kind of uh, put the bait out there by not resisting. I mean, not basically saying that you wasn't appalled at at it, but you let it just kind of uh, lead. You know, I feel what you're saying. That's what I was. Yeah, I, I. I if you don't say anything against it, it can go down, you know? Exactly. I thought Gus would probably have, I tried to get him to do that at the uh, black, uh, I mean at the white, uh, what's it, uh, white privilege conference. I said, I, I, I told Gus, I said, just let, just see what'll happen. <laughs> just make yourself available. <laughs> just, just make. <laughs> I, 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 I was, I, I, I was one hundred percent positive he could, he was gonna come back with a story. Uh, if he would have made himself available, I, I know somebody, somebody, would have uh, propositioned him. I was I was almost certain, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that environment it, it would be. In, in fact, I suspect that environment uh, you could probably take a stance that I'm not down for that, and it could still happen. Uh, I suspect they would just view that as as a challenge. Um, that'd be a real good environment if you just want to run experiments um, uh, of that nature. That'd be a real good environment over the, over the course of the three or four days or however long it goes uh, to try that, that sort of thing. In fact, Gus, you had a guest on your show that was hinting at you. What's her name? Oh, man. Uh, the Blonde. Dana Carney? I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think so. She was hitting. She was hitting at you, brother. You say such cool things. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I want to work with you. What? <laughs> 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 that boy, you better never find yourself in a room with her alone. <laughs> oh, I thought that was so funny. But you know, Gus was yeah. like, hey, I'm trying to get information. I ain't interested in that. <laughs> oh, I'm trying man. to help people understand this system. Kept none of the other stuff you're talking about. She's supposed to be. She's supposed to be coming back. I just. I just emailed her. I just even because she said uh, if that's the correct person, she said uh, that there was some study that said uh, uh, sexual. Rela- oh, I don't know what term she used, but dating or sexual relationships or whatever. That's uh, that's how you can you can overcome racism. And uh, I told her to send me the study, and I would love to have her back to chat about that study. We spent the whole show talking about that, and she uh, she didn't give me the study, so I emailed her today. So uh, hopefully she'll she'll get that to me, and maybe we can get her back again because yeah, real interesting. Oh yeah, I got a feeling she's gonna be getting back to you. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What you call that? Some I, I don't. Uh, one of the listeners, now, he said he felt like the callers, or he might have been talking about me too, but I felt he was talking about the callers, that they did not get at her because she was a white woman. They they kind of let her off the hook that people would call in and get rowdy with, uh, I don't know, Tim Wise or other other white guys, white males, he felt, that are on the show. But he felt like the people that called in didn't really, didn't really get at her, cause, and he felt it was because she's a, a white woman. Hmm. Yeah, I remember reading that. It was just, to me, it was a very, um, it was very <clears throat> relaxed show type of, it was cool. I just felt like it was so obvious that the, inform- uh, the information was the, like you said, the information was the key in that whole thing. I think that, I, I really thought about that show. That was a sh- that was a good show, but to me, that show had a lot of um, hidden messages. As far as uh, I really did feel like you would have to be, you would have to understand uh, a little bit about this system to get all of the meat off off that bone. Me and the show. That's a was a metaphor for, for the show, but. Because she she was saying things that if you don't know how these uh, meetings go, like some of these business uh, meetings and how these people behave, and it makes black people very uncomfortable, I've seen, where you have to smile all the time and they want you to be cheerful like you're a cheerleader or something, you know what I'm saying? And black people get, they don't understand it, but they teach that. They actually teach that, you know. So it's like it's like they teach they're teaching these people how to be little uh, like robots or something, and she was using it on the shows. That's why I felt it was just so obvious that she was using her own little technique. It was over the top, actually, but. I don't. I just felt like Gus wasn't somebody that could. That was, you know, that was even, you know, phased by that. So, yeah. I mean, Gus, did you pick up that she was flirting with you, or, or, or when you spoke with her before, did you already have kind of an idea? We didn't. Um, we didn't talk on the phone um, before the show. We just we we communicated quite a bit, but it's all email basically. No, um, so. No. That was pretty much the first time I had I heard her voice. Um, we talked on the phone, uh, the the program. Um, um, I definitely felt uh, like that kind of flirty chipper vibe. Uh, some of that was present in the email. Like she was, like when I asked on the show, I said, you, "Doctor, I mean, she's a doctor. She has a PhD. I mean, as goofy as she sounded on the show, that's a very informed white woman." 
Um, it's like, you know, Dr. Carney, what do you want? And she's like, oh, just Dana's fine. That's the same kind of tone that she had in the email. Um, Dana's fine, blah, 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 real jokey, uh, relaxed about things. So, um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm kind of, you know, I'm not out in the game thing. I don't go to the clubs. I'm not into to trying to pick up uh, and talk to chicks. So I suspect I probably miss a lot of that stuff that comes because I'm just not really focused on that, generally speaking, because uh, I know, People, people told me they had they felt the same vibe when uh, Jessica Pettit was on the show the first time uh, last way back when last July, um, and I wasn't really picking up on that either. But they were picking out specifically kind of similar things, like she was just things she was joking about, words that she used. I think Jessica Pettit she had said that uh, she's very attracted to the show, and they picked up on her use of the word attractive, like she didn't say she enjoyed the show or she liked it or whatever. Uh, just different things like that. So I I can see it when people point that out, but it's not something that I'm really, you know, thinking on consciously as we're going going through the program. No, okay. Uh, Jimmy Rebel, that song he sang, that one good nigger. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was like a a, a straight ballad uh, at the at the at the at the uh, I can't say the name of the the club because you know it's a, it's an expletive. But yeah, he at the club and he's he's basically singing a love song to uh, Uncle Ruckus <laughs> called "One Good Nigger." <laughs> Oh man, that was classic. That's classic. <laughs> it, it was it's the gayness, man. The gayness is is pretty uh, it's pretty uh, yeah, yeah. It's pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, I don't really know what to say. Um, I just I just looked uh, the next week since I was uh, disappointed with this week. Next week is uh, I'd say it's Stink Meter is coming back. He'll be back next week. Next week is uh, Stink Meter three, the Hateocracy. That's the name of the episode. Um, so yeah, I don't know if uh, I don't think I'm doing a third a third Boondocks next week, but uh, yeah, I will be watching that one. Um, and we're supposed to have a sh- Timothy is supposed to be here next week, so uh, hopefully that'll be my unwind. I can kick back and, and see what's up for next week. Um, we are about to close out. We have about two minutes left. If uh, anybody has anything they want to get out in the next two minutes, go right ahead. I would just say download some of the archives. Uh, like you said, the Internet's been acting funny, so... Download the, the the episodes and um yeah the archives. It's a lot of a lot of good stuff there. I mean a lot of inf- information, a lot of information, good information. Uh, sound clips from uh that movie we were talking about. If <laughs> I would love to hear some sound clips from uh Bamboo. Bamboo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Nelly Fuller, I would love to hear from him again. He's uh, uh he's uh, you probably him tomorrow if you go to uh, Talktainment Talktainment Radio. Uh, he should be on tomorrow at uh, uh, if you're West Coast, he should be on at four o'clock. Go to uh, Talktainment uh, Talktainment Radio dot com. I think uh, if you go to that. Um, or just Google Talk Tame and it should take you to their site. But he should be on tomorrow at four o'clock. Um, when I talked to him last week, he said, uh, "I guess the gentleman's agreement they made is he's not supposed to be doing other radio programs." But he said he will talk to them and see about the summer. So we'll see if we can get him back um, for the summertime. See if I can work on that. Those shows are an archive. They. They are rebroadcast, but I have not seen where they have, uh, where they offer listeners the opportunity to download them. Um, they do come back on, so if you miss it, like on Monday, you can tune back in and hear it uh, at a different time. But it's, 
yeah, it just I haven't seen a schedule, so it's hard to figure out when they're rebroadcast, and I haven't seen where you got the ability to download. So, but I, I'm sure you could email them and ask, you know, okay. or call. <clears throat> Thanks, Gus. Thank you all. Hope it was uh, constructive. Uh, we'll be back on uh, Wednesday, very full week. Um, we're scheduled to have a show every day from Wednesday to Monday, um, two shows on some of those days. Uh, we'll be back Wednesday, Kevin and Nett. Hope it was constructive. Uh, yeah, people have said that some of the, sometimes the Internet has been a little funky and that they've had some problems downloading or just even listening. Uh, to the streaming audio. If you have problems, you can go to Blueberry.com. It's B-L-U-B-R-R-Y.com. Again, B-L-U-B-R-R-Y.com. And just-